Good evening. I hereby call the Palm Springs regular city council meeting of December 9th, 2021 to order. For those who would like to join us, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. City Clerk, if you could please conduct a roll call. Councilmember Garner. Here. Councilmember Kors. Here. Councilmember Woods. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Here. Mayor Holstech. Here. All councils present. Thank you. So we have a few short presentations tonight um, before we move to the appointment of the new incoming mayor and Mayor Pro Tem, which we're so excited about. I know we have some special guests in the audience here to celebrate with us. But first, we have a presentation by the Palm Springs Animal Shelter. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. We're all so excited for your presentation, so thank you. <laughs> Thank you too, uh, it's Jenny Fote, and uh, um, thank you for having us. I remember before COVID, it's kind of nostalgic seeing this because before COVID we had cats running along the top here. Um, uh, and so it's been, a, it's been a long haul for the animal shelter also, but it's been a great time for us because during COVID we did adopt out many, many cats and many, many dogs. Uh, uh, to keep people company uh, when we were most of us were at home. So I have with me tonight uh, Bart Berry, who is our Director of Development. And most importantly, we have uh, Muffin, who, M Muppet, Muppets. Muppet, uh, who is a rescue. Um, and this dog was so bad when the dog came into the shelter that I want to show you a couple of things. Um, these were the rocks that were embedded into her fur uh, because she had lived out on the streets for so long and her fur was so matted um, that, that we had to take, we had to shave her and take all these rocks out. And the best part of these, this story is only one of the stories that we, we have to tell uh, with some of our, our, our other dogs and, and our cats. There's some really really sad stories, but the good stories are the fact that we have, last week we adopted out seven dogs and one cat in one day. And uh, so I just want to introduce Bart, who's going to talk to you about what we're doing and about, uh, yep. we should put her up. Yeah. So you can see her. She's going to be my little assistant here while I talk. So this is Muffet. Uh, she was found uh, under a bridge on Racket Club a few days ago, about three or four days ago. She was not chipped, uh, microchipped. Uh, nobody has come to claim her. And as Ginny said, she was very, very matted. So we've given her a really good haircut. We had to remove a little growth on the back of her leg. And tomorrow she goes in for some dental work. Uh, so by the end of the week, or actually by early next week, she'll be good as new and ready to be adopted. So she is looking forward to uh, uh, her new life. Uh, I just wanted to say on behalf of the Palm Springs Animal Shelter, it's really great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I joined the, uh, the staff of, uh, most recently, and before that, I was a small dog walker. So every Monday and Wednesday morning, I volunteered at the shelter to walk little dogs like Muppet, uh, and that was really a great experience. So I'm super thrilled to now be a part of the staff. Uh, and I want to thank all of you for your continued support of the shelter because it's very, very meaningful. Just wanted to give you a few statistics if I move her leg just a little bit. <laughs> there we go. Got it. Yep. So since uh, January 1st, we have adopted out 2,575 cats and 1,313 dogs. So all in 2021. So that's really, really amazing. And uh, that's really testament to the support that you continue to give us. In the shelter right now, we have 162 cats and dogs and 40 in foster. So we are pretty packed to the gills right now. And we do invite the public to come and see who we have 
in the shelter at the, this moment and who are up for adopt, which animals are up for adoption. And we came up with a, a pretty novel idea around the holiday season recently. We are going to be offering people the opportunity to purchase adoption gift certificates. So if you know, if people know of someone who is interested in adopting, they can buy an adoption certificate for a dog or a cat or a guinea pig. We have a turtle right now too, so if anybody needs a turtle, uh, come on by. And you can give that adoption certificate to somebody as a gift for the holidays. They can then redeem that as they come in and find the animal that they would like to take home. So we invite everyone, uh, the public, to join us. Uh, give us a call, stop by, and learn a little bit more about that and, and check out the animals that we have. So thank you so much again, and on behalf of Muppets and everybody else, uh, have a great holiday season. Thank so you so our much. The motto is to don't buy for the holidays, adopt for the holidays. Right. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny and Bart. <laughs> and thank you, Muppet. Next, we have a COVID update. Um, so I think the city manager will be describing the COVID update we're receiving tonight. Yeah, thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, we wanted to get you some perspective from medical experts. So we have a couple of guests who can join us. Um, but just wanted to clarify that we do have a deliberation of COVID protocols and we will review transmission, hospitalization and other standard data during that time. So I think it's really best during this um, early portion where we wanted to accommodate busy schedules to hear from some medical experts, get some perspective on uh, our public policies and how they relate to health outcomes and ask those kinds of questions, just noting that we will have deliberations later on in the agenda. Thank you. So our first guest, I believe, is by Zoom. So tonight we have Director Kim Zulatari from the Riverside County Public Health. And then we also have an update um, from one of our hospitals. So we will wait for those guests to join the Zoom room and they will hear their short update. Hi, welcome. You're live with the Palm Springs City Council and our community who is watching along. Thank you for joining us. If you could please introduce yourself and then go ahead and give your short COVID update and then we'll see if the council has any questions for you. So thank you so much for being here tonight. Great, it's wonderful to be with you all tonight. I'm Dr. Utham Kentaxis and I'm the Medical Director of Tenity Emergency Department at Eisenhower Health in Rancho Mirage. We, um, I was asked, I think, to talk a little bit about uh, COVID-19 currently in the Valley and uh, in a little bit of an update. We're seeing about the same level of patients that we've been seeing for the past month or two. It's actually leveled out pretty much, and we're in a little bit of a steady state. Um, I think that vaccination rates in the Coachella Valley have been very good. Um, up to, I think, 80 to 90 percent. When you look at Riverside County, it's a lot lower, but I think we've been able in the Valley to, to increase that, and particularly recently in the East Valley. So that's been a real positive. Um, we have not seen a, a, any spike in cases uh, related to the Omicron virus, um, and it seems like most of the cases for vaccinated individuals um, are fairly mild or people are able to manage at home. And many of the admissions are either under vaccinated, immune compromised or unvaccinated uh, individuals. Thank you so much. We appreciate your expertise in providing a, an update from the hospital and Eisenhower. Um, so I'll ask if council members have any questions. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Uh, thank you. Doctor, thank you for being with us this evening. My pleasure. A couple of steps that we've taken here in Palm Springs that uh, 
other cities across the country have taken, but not many within our region, is to uh, require uh, that individuals wear a face covering when uh, they are indoors. We have made an exception for individuals that are in dining and uh, bar establishments to allow them to remove the masks uh, when they are indoors eating and drinking, but we've asked uh, in turn that they then demonstrate before entering the bar or restaurant that uh, they have been vaccinated or that they have a uh, negative uh, COVID test within the last few days. Uh, could you comment from a medical perspective as to the efficacy of measures of this type? Well, it's interesting. I was recently in New York City, which has a, a citywide mandate uh, for the very same thing. And uh, we uh, would show our IDs and our, uh, and our vaccine status on every, every time we went out. Um, I think in general, those things will actually help mitigate in the short term. The question is, when does it end and does that change the overall outcome of the virus? So at some point, we're, we're going to be in a kind of an endemic state with the virus where it's present in the community, kind of ongoing, and uh, obviously vaccination is the real key to preventing serious illness, but it doesn't mitigate all illness and, and or transmission uh, based on the studies. The good news is that the Omicron virus is a little less uh, virulent, so you, you, it's easily, tr relatively easily transmittable, but the cases aren't as bad. So we're hopeful, and it seems like the booster is pr is really protective of against it. Uh, at least for Pfizer, that's the first study we've seen. So those are all good news. You know, in Palm Springs, if you have a local area that's that follows that protocol, but we don't integrate the entire Coachella Valley, there may not be as much uh, bang for your buck in terms of making those decisions because there's a lot of cross-pollination throughout the valley. So I would think that the really the only way that that, that kind of decision-making would work is if there was a collaboration between all of the cities in the Coachella Valley but even at this time of year, that may not be as effective because now we're seeing people coming from all over the world, really, to the Coachella Valley. So it's not a, a, a closed unit, you might say. I know in Los Angeles, they they have uh, similar requirements. They're at about 75% vaccination for all of LA County. Riverside's only 56%. But when you look at the Coachella Valley, we actually are a little better than Los Angeles. So, you know, I, from a medical perspective, any kind of protection, so you, you make sure you're vaccinated and you make sure you're wearing a mask is going to decrease your risk. Um, but there are other consequences, which is, are you just delaying the inevitable or are we um, uh, basically you know, kind of uh, putting a, a restriction on ourselves that may have other consequences. So mask wearing in young people um, definitely has some psychological aspects. Um, uh, you know, certain people may not get the vaccine for medical reasons. There are very few, um, but those people then are restricted from, from being in public. Um, and there are there are questions about whether you have the freedom to make a choice. So those things all come into play from a medical perspective. Yes, in the short term, it will help, but I'm not so sure that in the long term, you're going to see any real change in outcomes overall, say over a year period. From your experience, and that's very helpful. Thank you. Are there strategies that you are finding that are proving more effective at helping persuade individuals that uh, are on the fence to get the vaccine to, in fact, go out and become vaccinated? Yeah, and I've done this quite a bit over the last you know, year, basically, is I really find that 
um, lowering the temperature of rhetoric and really talking about the vaccine and how it works and what it's doing and not making it a panacea for the, uh, for the, you know, uh, we're going to fix this by everybody getting vaccinated. Well, yes and no, but what we can do is lower your personal risk. And when we talk about it that way and the risk of the people around you, I think people respond to that better. And I also think explaining it in terms of just specifically how the vaccine works, specifically addressing um, some mythology about the vaccine uh, with each individual, I find that's really helpful. And I think what we're seeing is a lot of social media influence and a lot of, um, you know, over the airwaves influence of, of kind of highly opinionated people that are saying some broad statements that may or may not be accurate. And I think people then start looking for what they want to hear, and it just is feeds into their their mythology. So I try to take a step back and say, look, tell me where you're at and let's talk about your concerns about it. And then let me try to show you some information that might be helpful to you. So I think if we do that, we can really address the issue significantly. You know, when people don't get vaccinated, they really are putting themselves at the biggest risk, to be honest with you. Doctor, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions from council members? I don't see any doctor. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. We appreciate your expertise, sharing it with our community and everything you've done to save lives over this pandemic. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you all for all your support of the hospitals. We really are grateful. Thank you, doctor. Take Next, care. Thank you. Next, we have our county public health director and their office joining us by Zoom. So we will next call her up. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, yeah. welcome. You are live with the Palm Springs City Council. If you're watching the meeting, if you could please uh, mute that and get out of that. He's sharing it with window. Thank you so much. Um, so welcome. You are live with the Palm Springs City Council and our community. If you could please introduce yourself um, and go forward with your COVID-19 update. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I am Kim Sarawatari, the Director of Public Health for Riverside County, um, and it's a pleasure to be here with you all. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I did want to relay some data uh, specific to Palm Springs about COVID-19. So Palm Springs is about 2% of the county population. You account for about 1.7% of our COVID cases right now. So you're slightly better than our county average in terms of cases of COVID-19. Um, I think where Palm Springs really shines, and I appreciate the proactiveness of the council, uh, is the fact that our um, number of fully vaccinated individuals in the county is at, or the percentage is at 57.1%. In Palm Springs, we are at 80.1%. So you are significantly higher than the county average when it comes to uh, vaccination status, and that's fully vaccinated individuals. Um, overall, as a county, we are seeing our cases tick up just slightly right now um, in the last couple of weeks. So our case rate is at 15.6 per 100,000. Um, and our overall positivity, so the percentage of tests that come back positive, we are at 6.1%. Um, we are higher than the California case rate and the California positivity. So we do, we do still have pockets of disease in the county um, and areas where transmission is occurring. Uh, you heard the, the doctor talk about the Omicron variant. We have not had any confirmed cases of Omicron in Riverside County. However, we do feel like more than likely it is present in our community. It just has not been detected. Um, we are continuing to try to get out into areas where vaccine numbers are not as high. And uh, doing that really in partnership with community-based organizations and faith-based organizations because we know that people that are part of the community and trusted messengers have much more success. Uh, we arm those folks with information, with materials, um, and then they're out in the community every single day, um, educating the community, answering questions, and then also partnering with us to make vaccine clinics 
and testing locations, testing uh, sites available so that people have access um, in an easy way. So uh, those are kind of a high level summary of what we're seeing in the county right now. Hospitalizations have remained relatively stable. They go up and down a bit, um, but we do know that a lot of the hospital numbers that we're seeing overall, when we hear about um, strain on the hospital system, a lot of those numbers are not due to COVID only. And so I think when we think about the hospital system, the part that is worrisome is if we do see another surge uh, this winter, um, our hospital system is not down to the level we were at prior to our last winter surge. So in other words, we're starting at a, a higher level. Um, staff are fatigued. We have fewer beds available now than we did when we started our last surge. So that's a bit concerning. We don't have kind of the capacity and flexibility within our healthcare system. Uh, although I will say that our hospital partners uh, have been incredibly um, uh, creative in uh, dealing with surge and uh, working with staff and trying to um, accommodate the number of patients that they are seeing. So they've been tremendous partners throughout the whole COVID response. And, and I do want to recognize that. Um, I think that those are, that's kind of a high level overview of what's going on. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Director. Thank you so much for that. Do any council members have questions? I see council member Dennis Woods. Uh, thank you very much. Can you tell me what is um, the CDC's guidelines and um, the, the county's guidelines and the effectiveness of wearing a face mask indoors, like at gyms or at retail establishments? Sure, thank you. Um, so both CDC and CDPH recommend wearing a face covering when you are indoors, um, mostly because you don't know the vaccination status of others around you and the, the virus can still be spread. So the recommendation from both CDC and the state health department is that you wear a, uh, excuse me, a mask um, when you are indoors. And the County of Riverside, we follow the CDPH um, guidelines and recommendations. So we would also recommend that. Council Member Kors. Sure, um, and thank you for being here and thank you and your team for work throughout this. We really appreciate the availability that everyone in County Public Health has made for us is really appreciated by our entire community. Um, uh, so Council Member Woods just asked about masks. I'm going to ask the other question. So um, one of the rules we have in place in Palm Springs is that to dine indoors in a restaurant or drink in a bar indoors, um, you need to be vaccinated or have a recent negative COVID test. While outdoors, you don't need that. And later on tonight, we're going to discuss, and there are all kinds of different issues on policies, but it would be good to get your sense if you see that as significantly protective compared to people being in those establishments or workers in the kitchens being unmasked and, unvac and potentially unvaccinated. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so I, I think, you know, I would point again to the fact that both CDC and CDPH recommend indoors people do wear masks. Um, I think that there have been lots of studies uh, that show that when you are indoors, you are at higher risk for disease transmission. Outdoors, that risk is lowered. So eating outside is certainly safer than eating inside in a restaurant. Um, and when you are working in a restaurant, then you are um, constantly around people who are not wearing masks. And so wearing a mask as an employee of a restaurant um, or a retail establishment or whatever the case may be, I think uh, is an effective tool in minimizing your risk of transmission. Um, and so I, I do think that those are important strategies for keeping the community safe and keeping employees safe. And I think that there's, there's plenty of science to back that up in terms of kind of the strategies, um, the layering effect of strategies uh, to prevent COVID-19 transmission. Obviously vaccination is the best, um, wearing a mask, social distancing, hand washing, those are really the four big strategies that we point to when it comes to reducing risk. Thank you. And just follow up, sort of looking at CDC or the California Department, sort of best practices for indoor dining or indoors at a bar where people are not going to be wearing masks, right, because they're eating and drinking. And um, is requiring everyone who's indoors to be vaccinated or negatively tested from a medical perspective helpful in preventing spread? 
Um, again, I would say certainly it reduces the risk, right? Okay. Because if you're vaccinated, then you're, you're reducing the risk of transmission. If you're wearing a mask between, um, you know, between eating and, and drinking, that reduces your risk. If you're, you've recently tested negative, also reduces the risk. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Director. I just have a question about protecting workers. So we've read studies and we've had significant conversations here about restaurant workers, especially cooks, and some of those workers being in the highest, um, having experiencing the highest rates of COVID and even mortality. So could you tell us a little bit about um, what CDC or other recommendations are in protecting workers in restaurants um, and other plate closed and workplace environments? Sure. Thank you um, for the question. So I think the strategies are similar to what we just talked about in terms of, um, you know, certainly vaccination is going to be the best way to protect the employees. Um, and then beyond that, wearing a mask. One of the things that's very difficult to tell when we do a public health investigation, unless there is a clear outbreak going on, it's difficult to tell where an exposure occurred. So if you have employees that um, are working in an environment they're living in an environment where um, perhaps people are not vaccinated, perhaps there are other high-risk individuals, high risk for exposure. It's difficult to say whether the exposure occurred in the workplace or in the home. And so um, for that reason, I think it's really important that folks are vaccinated um, and you know, wearing a mask is really, uh, as I mentioned, CDC and CDPH's recommendation for protecting employees. Uh, and I think that's a really important strategy when you think about that layering effect because it's harder for your kitchen staff um, to have social distance or to um, do some of the other things that might help protect them. So those are really the two important strategies that would help protect your workers. Thank you. And do you have updates about the federal requirement to vaccinate workers for employers over employers that have over 100 workers? Is that the current rule or is it tied up in litigation? Could you give us an update if you know? Yeah. Uh, so my understanding at this point is that it is um, tied up in litigation, um, but I certainly am, am not an attorney, so uh, probably not the best person to advise you on that. Thank you. I am an attorney. I still don't know. So I was asking you. <laughs> and then do you have an update uh, for vaccine and vaccination rollout for children? So I've heard different updates about um, when children under five or over six months might, might have access to the vaccine. Yeah, absolutely. So let me give you just um, some quick numbers on where we are with kids that are eligible so far. So in our 12 to 17 year old um, population, we have fully vaccinated 105,123 of those kids. So about 49.4% of that eligible population. Um, and then an additional almost 13,000 are partially vaccinated, meaning that they've received one of a two-dose series because remember they are eligible for Pfizer vaccine. Um, in our five to 11-year-olds are fully vaccinated. We have 9,262 that are fully vaccinated um, and that's 4.1% of the population. And then an additional 13,022 that are partially vaccinated. So again, received one dose of the two-dose series. Um, so, uh, you know, the numbers are going up. The five to 11 year olds was only recently authorized. We have been working closely with school districts uh, to um, hold vaccination clinics on campus for um, kind of ease of access so that parents can get kids vaccinated. And we have seen a lot of interest in vaccinating children. When we think about under five year olds, um, we are still, they're still doing uh, some of the studies and evaluation of the data. So I think that we are still probably um, several months away from having uh, vaccination approved for under five-year-olds, um, but it's something that we're closely monitoring. And then today, the FDA approved boosters for 16 and 17 years. So I think we will also see the eight um, of individuals being eligible for that third shot or a booster shot. I think that age will go down um, over time. So we're now down to 16 instead of 18 year olds. Thank you, Director. And I just have one last question for you. You spoke about exposures in the workplace for restaurant workers or other uh, workers in our region. And so we've heard about some exposures at large hotels, for example, with restaurant staff. Uh, do you have any information you could share that might be helpful about exposures or outbreaks that have happened in workplaces? 
Um, I, I don't have those data in front of me. Uh, we do publish a report that looks at occupational exposures, but again, very challenging to identify where the source of infection was. Um, we do just historically throughout the pandemic, some of our uh, higher risk areas would be um, in the hospitality industry just because of the fact that they are interacting with the public on a regular basis. Um, and so, uh, you know, that raises the risk for the employees. Um, but in terms of the actual data, I, I would have to pull the report and I'm happy to do so and send it to the council for review. Thank you, Director. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Uh, thank you. Uh, with uh, the increase uh, in number of people who are eligible for the vaccine, the booster, and uh, the new Omicron uh, rollout, are we seeing any uptick in the demand for uh, vaccinations and how satisfied are you with uh, the current level of vaccination sites that we have? Yes, thank you for those questions. Uh, we actually have seen an uptick in our demand for vaccines. Um, we have had several of our clinics um, where we're doing 300, 400, 500 vaccines in a single day. Um, some of our fixed sites had, had gone down to sometimes 20 vaccines a day, sometimes 30. They're now up between 100 and 200 vaccines per day. Um, and so we do attribute that to both increased eligibility in terms of age and also people who are um, uh, you know, hearing about the Omicron variant and perhaps that's encouraging them to get vaccinated. Uh, in terms of the number of sites, we as Riverside County have uh, five mobile teams that we... Um, that we have distributed throughout the county. So we will set up sites based on need, based on where our vaccination rates are low. And um, those teams have been very successful in vaccinating. Um, in, ter in terms of our fixed sites, we have two fixed sites. Uh, we found that our mobile teams are more successful at vaccinating uh, than our fixed sites at this point because um, the, the huge volume is not there. So our mobile teams are much more nimble. But beyond that, Riverside County Public Health only does about 8%, 8 to 12% of the total vaccines throughout the county. So the rest of the vaccinations are being done by private providers, by FQHCs, by pharmacies um, throughout the county. And we have around, um, let me see if I have the number exactly, uh, around 230 approved providers to vaccinate in Riverside County. So the vaccine is available. Um, I, I do want to just recognize, though, and underscore the fact that there are there are segments of the population that don't have access because they don't have transportation, they don't live near a bus, um, you know, those types of things. And so for those populations, we work very closely with our community and faith-based organizations to try to make transportation available or to bring mobile teams into those areas so that access is not a barrier to getting that. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Any final questions from council members? Seeing none, thank you so much for your work. I mean, we've seen you at these meetings, at multiple community meetings. We know you've been working incredibly hard to distribute vaccines, distribute public health information to our community, and we very much appreciate your hard work over these last 18 months or longer. So thank you very much, Director. Very much to all of you as well. Thank you. Have a great evening. And just for the public who's watching along, so we are deliberating or discussing and deciding that issue about COVID restrictions later on in the evening, but um, because of schedules, we had to hear those presentations right now. So we are going to hold that item and then discuss it as a council later on in the meeting. And now we are moving on to our next presentation, which is appointment of our incoming mayor and mayor pro tem. City clerk, if we could please have a staff report. Honorable mayor and city council, uh, pursuant to resolution number 24593, at the first meeting in December, the current mayor pro tem shall succeed to the position of mayor and the council member in the next sequential district shall be appointed mayor pro tem. Based on this rotation, Lisa Middleton should be appointed mayor and Grace Garner should be appointed mayor pro tem. And I'm available if you have any questions. Thank you. 
So next we'll see, we'll move forward for the oath of office um, ceremony. For um, we, we should do a motion. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I got excited. I want to do the ceremony. <laughs> so can we have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Thank you. There's a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, can we have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Woods. Yes. Councilmember Kors. Yes. Councilmember Gardner. Yes. Mayor Pro Tim Middleton. Aye. Mayor Holstitch. Yes. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. Now we will move on to the more exciting part, which is the oath of office by outgoing Mayor Holstage to Mayor Middleton. So we'll go ahead and go up here near, next to the flag and we will do the oath of office ceremony. Hi. So you're going to repeat after me. I, Lisa Middleton. I, Lisa Middleton. That while serving as the mayor of the city of Palm Springs. Well, that will serve as the mayor of the city of Palm Springs. Do solemnly affirm. Do solemnly affirm. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the Constitu Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. To the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely without any mental reserva reservation. That I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. And that I will well and faithfully. Discharge the duties upon which I'm about to enter. Discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Thank you. Here you go. Congratulations, Lisa. So next, we have Lily Suarez from Congressman Ruiz's office, who is here to present a proclamation to our new mayor, Mayor Middleton. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lily Suarez, and I am here with the office of Congressman Ruiz. Unfortunately, he is in Washington, D.C. and unable to be here physically. Um, but on his behalf, I am happy to present to you this certificate of congressional recognition in honor of being uh, named mayor, appointed mayor um, of Palm Springs. Congratulations in addition for being the first transgender mayor in California's history here in our very own city of Palm Springs. On behalf of the people of California's 36th congressional district, thank you so much for your dedicated service and congratulations.
Thank you. Next, we have comments from any council members, and it says comments from outgoing mayor. I'm going to hold my comments um, because I'd like to give an update about what we've achieved in the last year as a city council, um, but to not take away the moment, um, this historic moment, really, for the state of California and the country and for our city and swearing in uh, Mayor Middleton. I'll reserve those, and we will move to a performance by the Trans Chorus of Los Angeles. So we are so honored to have you here in the city of Palm Springs tonight. Thank you for being here. Uh, we very much appreciate it. So we will go ahead with your presentation and performance. All the voices crying out, we are one If you're really watching, you'll find a way to see There's no difference between you and me I may not walk a mile in my your shoes Congratulations, Mayor Middleton. Thank you for having the Trans Course Thank of Los Angeles.
Really beautiful performance. Thank you so much for gifting our community with that. We really appreciate you being here tonight and honoring Mayor Middleton and her historic appointment as mayor. Um, so with that, I will move to our, our next mayor um, for her comments. People are already calling you. <laughs> Welcome to the job. Here we go. All right. Uh, thank you. Wow. Uh, well, let me get into my speech, otherwise uh, I'll go off. But uh, I believe the two most important words in the English language are thank you. My thank yous always begin with my wife and my children. Uh, but I also want to add tonight a very large thank you to outgoing Mayor uh, Christy Holstage for your leadership over this past most difficult year. As with Mayor Coors, you are unable to enjoy conducting public meetings in a public place with the public present. I, think, I thank you for swearing me in. The example of a departing leader passing responsibility to an incoming leader is something we used to take for granted, but we don't anymore. My thanks and congratulations for the opportunity to serve with Mayor Pro Tem Garner. I want to give a special shout out and thanks to uh, Lily and Congressman Ruiz for your support. Uh, to Carolyn Coleman, the Executive Director of the League of California Cities for being here this evening. Uh, I am awed by the Trans Chorus of Los Angeles, and yes, tonight we are, in fact, victorious. <laughs> Thank you to my colleagues for this opportunity. I will do my best when speaking on behalf of our city and our council to reflect a unified voice with full respect to the unique views and our individual responsibilities to our districts. Thank you to all of the men and women who are employed by the city of Palm Springs. It is because of you and your work that we matter to the residents and visitors of our city. You are, in fact, the ones who make a difference. Most importantly, thank you to the people of this incredible, unique place we call home Palm Springs. Thank you for the opportunity to serve you. Thank you for the trust you place in each of us. Municipal government is the most accessible of all government entities. You have our phone numbers, our email addresses, you know where we live, and you stop us in grocery aisles, hardware stores, and pretty much everywhere we go. I'll never forget being stopped by a constituent at a farmer's market in Santa Fe, New Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> that is as it should be. Earlier this week, we recognized our police and firefighters, honoring over a dozen of our public safety professionals, men and women who literally saved lives and showed extraordinary courage putting their life at risk in order to save someone else's life. In this city, as in other cities, we have serious challenges before us. We have to respond to the COVID pandemic and the pandemic of homelessness. It is past time that California figure out once again how to build an adequate supply of housing. Each of us has a role to play in addressing climate change but let me talk about something else this evening. There are 19,495 incorporated cities in the United States. There have been cities in our country for over 400 years, 
And tonight, for only the third time in the history of this country, a transgender American has been sworn in to be mayor of an American city. It has been 69 years since Christine Jorgensen was outed on page one of the New York Daily News with a headline equal to that used to announce the end of a world war. 52 years since Marsha P. Johnson stood up at Stonewall. 48 years since Jan Morris helped change my life with the publication of Conundrum. Tragically though, it has only been a few days since the last elected official, virtually, if not literally, stood in a doorway blocking a transgender child from full access to a public school, a public playground, and in some states from the accepted standards of medical care for transgender youth. To be transgender in America today is to know both hope and fear. Our fears are grounded in the lived experience of each of us. They are grounded in the lives lost to violence, to the jobs we did not get, or the jobs we were not able to keep. They are grounded in the health care that was specifically barred from us. But nothing offers more hope than the loving parents of transgender children standing up to the bullies and standing up for their children to be able to grow up to be adults living full, authentic, and equal lives. For every elected official blocking doorways, there are others opening doors. And across the country, there are places like Palm Springs where the welcome mat is out. I am so grateful and proud of my hometown. Whether you are a lifelong desert rat or a convert to, the, to Palm Springs, you have welcomed Cheryl and I with open arms. Every day I encounter people in this city making a difference in restaurants, retail, the arts, government, and every walk of life. Their talent is world class. But, so, but for so many, where they were raised, it was not their talent, their work ethic, or their compassion that mattered. It was simply who they were. Turned away at home, we have made a new home and a new family here in Palm Springs. Our work in this city is far from done, but in this city, it will always matter most what you are willing to work for and what you are prepared to give back to others. My thanks, and let's get back to work. Congratulations, Lisa. Mayor Middleton, we will now recess for 10 minutes and then we will go back to our offices um, and complete the meeting by Zoom. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you for celebrating with our community.
add urgency items, note abstentions or no votes on consent calendar items or request consent calendar items be removed for a separate discussion. I would like to entertain a motion for the acceptance of the agenda. Are there any items that staff or a council member would like removed uh, from the consent calendar for separate discussion or vote? The city clerk does remind us that we must consider public hearing item 2A related to redistricting at 7 p.m. And I'm requesting that we consider item 4A related to COVID-19 emergency orders immediately after agenda item 2A. Are there any items that anyone would like to remove from uh, the consent calendar? Uh, Council member, or Mayor Pro Tem Garner. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to note my recusal for item 1M, as in Mesquite. Um, that's, I have to recuse um, for business reasons. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any others? Council member, uh, Holstage. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I also need to note a recusal on item 1M as Mesquite due to potential financial conflict. Thank you. Any others? Uh, does staff have any other uh, changes to the agenda that they would like? Hearing none, can we get a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, roll call vote, please. Council member Kors. Yes. Council Member Holstedge. Yes. Council Member Woods. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Gardner. Yes. Mayor Middleton. Aye. Motion passes five to zero. Uh, I would like to request that City Attorney uh, Jeff Ballinger provide a report of the closed session. Yes, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council, members of the public at home. The City Council met in closed session earlier this afternoon to discuss the items that are listed on the agenda. Uh, there was no reportable action, but the record should reflect that Council Member or Mayor Pro Tem Garner uh, did recuse on one of the potential uh, litigation items due to a source of income. Uh, and that's it. Thank you. Uh, the next. Uh Item is public testimony. This time has been set aside for members of the public to address the city council on non-public hearing agenda items only. Two minutes will be assigned to each speaker. You are asked to please begin your time by telling us what agenda item or items you are speaking about. Please note that testimony for public hearings will be taken at the time of the public hearing and general public comment for subjects not on the agenda will be taken later in the evening. Tonight, the city clerk will be contacting speakers via telephone. Uh, Mr. Mejia. Bruce Hoban, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Good evening, city council and staff, and a big congratulations to Mayor Middleton. I'm on this call tonight speaking about COVID-19 mandates, agenda item 4A. I've been asked to speak on representing Palm Springs Hospitality Association and Palm Springs Resort Board members to avoid using 30 minutes of your valuable time with 15 or more separate comment calls tonight. I would like to read a short excerpt from the letters you've already received from both associations. From the beginning of the pandemic, Palm Springs has become known as a safe place to live work and visit due to your proactive actions. Given the unknown situation with the Omicron variant, more people gathering indoors due to the cooler weather, the seasonal holidays, and the increase in infections, even among vaccinated individuals, we strongly support, and I will emphasize, we strongly support the city of Palm Springs in continuing these COVID-19 safe mandates through the new year. I will quickly read you the signers of these letters from the Palm Springs Resort Board members who have restaurants, 
and food and beverage served at gatherings and hotels, Aftab Dada, the Hilton, Celeste Brackley, Ace Hotel and Swim Club, Robert Hunt, Alcazar Hotel, Stephen Boswell, Palm Mountain Resort, Avalon Palm, and Ingleside Inn Hotel with Melvins, Eric Hill, Hotel Zoso, La Donna Cannavaro, Hyatt Suites, Peggy Truff, Kenton, the Rowan, Curtis Pendis, Saguaro Hotel. Associate board members who signed this letter to you, Michael Braun, Quick Development and Il Corso Restaurant, Rob Hampton, Palm Springs Convention Center and Bureau of Tourism, Jerry Keller, Lulu California Bistro, and Harold Metzer, Spencer's Restaurant. Additionally, Palm Springs Hospitality Association had a robust conversation at its board meeting this morning. Supporting the extension for your needs from this group include Patrick Service, Tarasso Los Consuelos, Jeffrey Bernstein, I'm sorry, Bruce. Destination That's the time. BSP. Denise Jansen Eager, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Good evening. I live within Palm Springs Country Club, which Serena Park Project surrounds. I'm speaking about item 1R. Please accept the maintenance and security plan as it is written. When this board first began discussing these recommendations on September 30th, I called in and voiced my opinion, sharing that the boards put over the hole in the wall along the road, and the road had fallen off. More serious an issue was that the walkthrough to the right of the gates on the corner of Verona Road and Whitewater Club Drive had still not been boarded up, allowing people to easily walk and ride their dirt bikes through. This has been an issue since the property was first purchased. Later in the meeting, Eric Taylor stated that since he now knows of these things, he can fix them. Since these meetings are recorded, you will be able to find his exact words if you wish. Shortly after the September 30th meeting, someone left a shopping cart inside the entrance and it had been filling up with trash and junk. I want to let you know that as of today, 70 days later, this front entry still has yet to be secured and people continue to pass through it daily on foot and with motorbikes. 70 days later from when Mr. Taylor first said he would take care of this, he still hasn't. He has known about this open front entrance since he first bought the property. He went on record saying he would fix it. He didn't. Mr. Taylor is not to be trusted. He is an absentee landlord who is using all of us who live alongside Serena Park Project to police his property for him because he says it's too expensive to do it himself. Even if given the chance to fix something like the front entrance, he won't do it. Please do not allow this to continue. Please accept the maintenance and security plan as it is written. Thank you. Thank you. James Green, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you. Good evening, council members. My name is James Green, and I'm a vice chair of the Gene Autry Neighborhood Organization, heading up our efforts regarding the plans, Serena Park, and Casa Verona housing developments. All of us want good, conscientious neighbors, ones who take pride in the appearance of their home and landscaping all the time, not just when they decide to sell. We want neighbors who communicate with us, keep an eye out for us, and respect us. Serena Park has many neighbors spanning across five different neighborhoods, including Ginotri, and as we all know, they have not been good neighbors. Tonight, this council has the opportunity and the duty to force the current developer, Mr. Taylor, and pending investor owner, Williams Homes, to finally be good neighbors by cleaning up and securing this property. Every recommendation put forward by city staff, particularly daily security patrols and required monthly meetings with code enforcement should be adopted and the developer held to strict compliance. It's time that Gene Autry residents and those of the four neighborhoods adjacent to the planned Serena Park development finally have some much needed relief. 
we all deserve good neighbors. The Gene Autry Neighborhood Organization supports quality development, appropriate density, and smart traffic management. We look forward to working with the developer to ensure these goals. We hope that your action tonight will finally put the Serena Park project on the path of being a quality development, both before, during, and after construction. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Madam Mayor, that does conclude public comment for tonight, and we were able to reach everyone that uh, registered. The next, I, uh, next item on the agenda is city council and city manager comments and reports. Uh, are there any reports from city council members? Madam Mayor, uh, given that it's seven o'clock um, and, and the public hearing does need to start as close to seven as possible, I would suggest that we go ahead and proceed to 2A. Uh, Mr. Mejia, thank you, and we will do that. So with that, let's move forward to agenda item 2A. And we will come back to the consent calendar. The next item is 2A, a public hearing regarding redistricting of city council boundaries and a review of the schedule of public hearings and community workshops. Mr. Mejia, do you have a report? Yes, Madam Mayor, and uh, uh, Mr. Jim Priest will be joining us via Zoom. Uh, he is our uh, attorney uh, representing the city regarding the uh, redistricting process, and he is an expert in all things elections. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to him for the presentation. Uh, before you uh, turn it over to Mr. Priest, uh, I don't know if I'm the only one, but uh, I'm not getting any video from uh, Chambers. Mr. Priest, welcome. Welcome, Madam Mayor. Good evening. How are you? Thank you. It's your turn, and we'll we will look forward to hearing from you. Okay. Well, uh, before I get started, uh, Mr. Mejia should have a, a PowerPoint standing by that we are ready to present to the council. PowerPoint is up. Yeah, PowerPoint's up and I've got the clicker. Wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Mejia. Okay. Um, we can't see it. Okay. Yeah. Can you, uh, I'm not seeing it. <laughs> Madam Mayor, can you hear? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, okay, great, great. Uh, we're having some technical issues uh, with the camera in chambers and with it being able to uh, provide the presentation. Oh my gosh! Okay. Uh, would you like me to wait another minute or two, or you shall I go ahead and wait? And uh, we okay. beg the we'll indulgence of the uh, public. Uh, we okay. didn't have these issues with the formerly uh, former mayor. Uh, I'll be right back. I got to run. See what's going on. Okay. <laughs> Um, Mr. Mejia, since we are having this issue, should we hold off or uh, and wait or try to proceed without the uh, PowerPoint? I, I would suggest we give a, 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 just a minute. We, we hear that PSC TV is working on the issue right now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
bottom there. You can see. Ah, there we go. All right. All right. All right, Mr. Priest, I think we are all set and operating now. So please uh, proceed. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council, honorable staff. It's a pleasure to be with you this evening. Jim Priest, Best Best in Krieger City Attorney's Office. Um, as the council will recall, last month we had our first public hearing concerning redistricting of the electoral map in the city of Palm Springs. Uh, that meeting was really an introduction to the process and also uh, soliciting any uh, early comment uh, that the city council or members of the public may have at that time. Um, this is now the second public hearing in a series of legally at least four, but you'll see on the schedule, we actually have a few additional uh, meetings and workshops built into the schedule right now. Um, at this meeting, uh, next slide, please. Um, um, let's see. Oh, I'm so sorry, Mr. Mejia, please back up. Thank you. Um, I just have a brief PowerPoint about our second public hearing this evening. I'm going to discuss project timelines. Uh, what we're also going to do tonight is uh, review our first set of draft maps. Um, and then we're also going to talk about next steps and hearings. Uh, in the redistricting process. Next slide, please. Um, just again, as way as background, we talked about this last month, city council members in the city of Palm Springs hold four-year terms. Uh, districts one, two, and three are elected in November of 2022. That will be their next election, and then 2026 and every four years. Districts four and five elect in November of 2024, and then 2028, and so on. Next slide, please. Um, here is um, a, sort of a roadmap of where we're uh, planning on going with this process uh, moving forward. As I said, we already had the first public hearing and uh, draft maps uh, have now been prepared and they've been released to the city's redistricting project website. Uh, we're having public hearing number two this evening. Uh, where we're going to review some of the draft maps. We're going to take public input, consider communities of interest and other factors uh, that the council would like uh, considered in looking at the maps. Um, we're going to talk about the initial deadline for draft maps. Uh, there will be a final public, final several hearings, and then ultimately a final public hearing next year, uh, where we will ultimately conclude with map adoption. And that would be by ordinance or resolution, and we have some procedural requirements prior to map adoption. Next slide, please. Um, in drawing maps, uh, these, this is sort of the overall summary of the rules and goals that must be followed in putting together maps. Uh, the touchstone is equal population. You always start the analysis by making the districts perfectly equal under the Federal Voting Rights Act. However, then we go to the next set of criteria, such as topography, geography, communities of interest. You're not legally required to make the districts absolutely mathematically equal. There is some deviation allowed in the law, uh, up to 10% deviation, so that you're not artificially dividing communities of interest or following geographically or top topographically illogical lines. And then we have other traditional principles as well, minimizing the number of voters that would be shifted to different election years, uh, respecting voters' choices, future population growth, and then preserving the core of existing districts. Next slide, please. So this is a map of our existing districts. And as you can see, District 1 starts in the north, and they, as they go up in number, they go south in geography. So District 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, going from north to south. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a summary of the uh, existing district boundaries with the new census data, the 2020 data. And we do this to determine uh, whether, in fact, the city has to adjust its boundary map. And the way we determine that is if you look uh, in that third column, it talks about percent deviation. And that's how much the population has deviated in that district from perfect equality. And you can have up to 10% deviation plus or minus. So if you look at district three, uh, there's been a lot of growth in that district. There's uh, almost 7.6% growth uh, since the last census here. 
And then District 1 is the one that has the least population relative to equality. It's 4.54% percent authorized under the Federal Voting Rights Act and case law. percent. So that's within legal parameters under the Federal Voting Rights Act. Um, next slide, please. And so again, we're in the acceptable range. It preserves the core of the existing districts. It tends to create more compact voting districts. It seems to minimize the number of voters who have to change their districts. There is one issue though with map option A, and that is when we, uh, the city clerk's office and the city attorney's office reviewed map option A, we noticed based on the demographic data that it was going to take district one below a majority minority district. Um, if I remember the numbers correctly, it would have dropped it down to about uh, 46% uh, non-white citizen voting age population. And so when we as staff reviewed that, we, we figured that was not consistent with the city council's principles and values. Uh, the other thing that Map Option A did is it did actually, it made more compact districts, uh, and it, it, but it did move a lot of people around. It made a lot of subtle changes. And so Map Option A does tend to be a bit more complex. Next slide, please. Can we have Map Option B? Next slide, please. <clears throat> this one also gets you down to an even lower total deviation at 3.23%. So that's really good for deviation purposes. Um, however, um, next slide, please. It preserves the core of existing districts. It creates, again, compact voting districts. It does seem to preserve existing neighborhoods. But again, it had a lot of moving parts, a lot of different pieces, uh, a lot of different people uh, moving on the map. Uh, it did seem to just get a uh, just keep district one above 50 percent majority minority. But as you'll see in a minute, map option C does that a bit more effectively. Next slide. Now, just a quick bit of background again. Uh, we looked at map option A and we looked at map option B and uh, we went back to the demographer after looking at those two maps and asked them to produce a map option C. Uh, that one uh, did its best to retain a majority minority in district one. And another thing is to simplify it, uh, less moving parts, less areas changing from one district to another. And next slide, please. And so this is map option C. Um, you can see the total deviation is down at 7.9. So could it be lower? Yeah, it could be, uh, but it's still within the legal parameters. It's still within the 10% deviation. So it does comply with the Federal Voting Rights Act. Um, next slide, please. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, no, actually leave the slide here. I'm sorry, put, put it back, thank you. So again, it's 7.9, preserves the core of existing districts closely aligns with current boundaries. So it, it tended to be a bit simpler. Again, less moving parts. And then again, it retained District 1 as a combined majority minority district. Uh, minimized the number of people moving again, and it kept the neighborhoods together. Um, so again, staff is presenting these three options to you uh, for your consideration. Again, A and B, we were, we're not quite certain if that was... Uh, you know, consistent with what the council uh, would have wanted to see, but we think map option C uh, gets us a lot closer to where we think the, the city may envision this. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, timeline and next steps. Uh, again, we've asked for your input and the public's input on the proposed options this evening. Uh, we will continue to evaluate any publicly submitted maps. Um, we'll be talking a little bit about uh, workshops coming up next week, uh, where we're going to be asking the public for their input uh, at that time as well. Uh, based on that input, we'll revise any proposed options, and then we're going to tee up for public hearing number three. And then again, we're going to continue to refine this process. Uh, next slide, please. So here's the more detailed schedule. Uh, again, we got the census data September 20th. 
Uh, we prepared draft maps. Uh, we're having our public hearing number two this evening. And again, next week, we're having community workshops each day in each of the different districts. I believe Mr. Mejia is going to get into more specifics about that uh, momentarily. Um, the deadline for the public to submit draft maps for review and the third public hearing will be January 15th. That's when we are scheduling the third public hearing tentatively. Next slide, please. Um, I'm sorry, January 15th was a deadline. January 27th would be public hearing number three. Um, and then tentatively, February 10th would be public hearing number four. If necessary, there may be another round of community workshops. Uh, but again, Mr. Mejia can talk more about that. Uh, finally, public hearing number five, April 17th is our deadline to get the map approved and then on to the county. And then any map that is approved by April 17th is going to apply to the November 8th, 2022 election, which is the next general election for council in Palm Springs. And that concludes my presentation, Madam Mayor, members of the council. I'm happy to enter, answer any questions you have. Mr. Priest, thank you. And Mr. Mejia, are there questions for either Mr. Uh, Priest or Mr. Mejia? And, and Madam Mayor, I do want to mention briefly, uh, uh, once we go through the questions with Mr. Priest, uh, I'll uh, continue on with the presentation to discuss the statement of principles and the accelerated schedule. All right. Thank you. Questions? No questions from anyone? All right. If there are no questions for staff at this time, I'd like to open the public hearing and the public is invited. Madam to Mayor? Yes. I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and continue on with the presentation if there's no questions for Mr. Priest. Thank you. Uh, if I could get the uh, PowerPoint back up. Uh, Madam Mayor, I do wanna mention and, and council and, and the public and community, um, when it comes to uh, drawing your own map, we now have the tool available for the public to participate in the map making process. If you go to psdistricts.com, uh, there are video instructions as well as uh, PowerPoint instructions on how to use the mapping system. I do wanna let the council know that we are already starting to receive maps from the community. Uh, those will be analyzed by the demographer so that we have the uh, demographic data to support it and, and uh, some analysis on whether or not those maps are legally compliant. And those will be presented at your next public hearing. Uh, when it comes to the statement of principles, um, uh, we did, I did uh, mark this up just slightly. Uh, when we went through the districting process the first time, uh, we really were focusing on the CVRA aspect. However, uh, now that uh, the districting process is over, but we're going through redistricting, it's more in line with uh, to follow the rules of the Federal Voting Rights Act and the Fair Maps Act. Um, and then under process, uh, I did strike out the first bullet uh, because that was really about uh, reforming our structure of government that has been accomplished and uh, uh, probably not as relevant to this process um, as much. But I'm happy to take any comments from council on this before we go through the accelerated schedule. Are there comments or questions for our staff at this time from council? Wonderful. So I'll go ahead and uh, proceed with the accelerated schedule. So our current schedule, uh, we've already reviewed that with you, uh, but as a comparison, it's on to uh, the left. On the accelerated schedule, we can uh, save six weeks in this process, which would obviously benefit potential candidates in having certainty in which um, district they would be residing in and can run from. Um, the result would be that on January 27th, we will go ahead and review the maps, but at that time, uh, council will need to select the finalist maps that you would like to keep in consideration. On February 2nd, instead of having uh, additional workshops, uh, uh, five additional workshops throughout the community, uh, we would conduct one or two uh, virtual workshops so that the community can look at these finalist maps, provide any comments before the fourth public hearing on February 10th in which the council could adopt a final map. If there was a need to go ahead and um, um, take more time, we obviously have the option to do that, but this would be an accelerated schedule that would save six weeks in the process. 
And I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Anthony, my question is just for, you know, if we're moving through this accelerated schedule, um, some of the workshops that would no longer happen, we're going to be at community locations that um, have a high attendance. So for instance, the James O'Jesse Center would no longer have um, a workshop there at that site. Um, and I think from this last process that we went through, we got, a, that place was packed. <laughs> it's, a, it's a really popular location for residents to to go. Um, so my question is just um, if we're able to add anything there, just because we know we we always get good feedback. Um, and if there's other locations that we're going to be in that second round that aren't anymore, kind of how do we accommodate some of those changes um, to the schedule? I, I would be happy to conduct um, one or two in-person sessions, definitely at the James O. Jesse Community Center. Um, I think it would be challenging for me uh, being, you know, limited to conduct five workshops in one week right before the, the final hearing. But uh, certainly if we wanted to uh, pick and choose a couple locations, perhaps uh, the convention center and, and Demuth, or I'm not sorry, not Demuth, but the Unity Center, um, and a virtual workshop. I think we can try to combine that into a day or two and, um, and then proceed to the, to the last public hearing. Okay, thank you, Anthony. And just one other thing on that. Um, is uh, that neighborhood group as well holds regular meetings. So I don't know if we could always reach out to them and ask them if they had any interest in doing it the same day to maximize number of people. I don't, I don't know what they think on that. I'm not, I don't want to speak for them. It's just um, an, an idea as well. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Mr. Mejia? Uh, Council member Holstich. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mr. Mejia, so sorry, can you go over the difference in community meetings and outreach meetings between the two options in a broader way? Absolutely. Give me just one second. And my question is, I just like to do it in a targeted, strategic way that, you know, is about equity and about outreach for the full districts. Um, so I want to make sure if we're picking and choosing, um, we do it that way. And then would like to, yeah, look at how important um, the community outreach meetings that we might miss out on doing an accelerated schedule, if that's worth it to move up the process. Certainly. So, uh, uh the second phase of community workshops were intended to occur, obviously, later in the process. However, council gave direction to conduct a meeting in uh, one, one location in every district. And so uh, currently, it's scheduled to occur at uh, Kawia Elementary School, the library, the convention center, uh, Vista Del Monte Elementary School, and James O'Jesse Community Center. And that would all occur in one week. Um, alternatively, uh, based on the comments that I've received from council so far, I think we could accommodate um, a meeting at James O'Jesse still, uh, perhaps one at the library or the convention center because it's a central location within the city, and then a virtual workshop because that will give everybody access to, to the meeting, provided that they have internet and, and those kinds of resources. But uh, that would be my suggestion for if, if council wants to proceed with an accelerated schedule. Thank you. Other questions or comments uh, for Mr. Mejia? And I just want to make one, one final comment, if I could. Um, when I sent out the memo to council, and I also posted it to the website and for the community to be able to access, on the last page of the memo uh, contains a map of uh, map C in which I tried to highlight the areas that were being affected in switching districts. I did fail to uh, highlight one area uh, that uh, Mr. Priest pointed out to me, and that is uh, to the east of the Taquitz uh, Creek Golf Course, there are some condominiums uh, that are adjacent to it. Those would move from District 1 to District 4. 
but uh, the Lawrence Crossley neighborhood would stay within District 1, and we would fix the map being error from the first time, ensuring that both sides of the street are contained in District 1. Uh, Mr. Mejia, the uh, revised map C that you put together, uh, how broadly has that been made known to the public? Uh, it was posted onto the website uh, along with the staff report, so it wasn't uh, in the agenda correspondence. It was posted with the normal agenda. However, I would say it's been fairly limited given that the map was just received yesterday. Um, however, we did receive comments from, from the community members that are typically highly engaged in the districting process, uh, like uh, Mr. Friedman and Ed Doobie. Right, thank you. Uh, Every effort that you can make to uh, make sure this particular map gets known to the public, I think, would be appreciated. Absolutely. And, and this will be the map that we focus on during the community workshops. I think we'll have some comments later, but uh, you, you're probably uh, absolutely accurate. Uh, is it time now for us to move to the public he hearing, Mr. Mejia? Yes, Madam Mayor. Okay, thank you. Uh, then uh, at this time, I would like to open the public hearing. The public is invited to speak on this uh, uh, public hearing for up to two minutes. And I do believe we have some speakers, Mr. Mejia. David Friedman, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you, Anthony. Good evening, Mayor Middleton, Mayor Pro Tem Gardner, and council members. My name is David Friedman. I first want to congratulate the mayor and Mayor Pro Tem on their new positions. It is a personal honor to see the person who got me involved in community service at Palm Springs be the mayor for the next year. It seems like just yesterday that the members of the CBRA working group, Mr. Crawford, myself, and many other community members came together to produce the existing council district map. Our efforts have been successful with a majority minority district that led to the election to council of our new mayor pro tem and the other council members who have shown great dedication to their districts. It is no surprise to me and the other residents of District 5 that Mayor Middleton was unopposed in a re-election bid last year. With that in mind, I would like to express my support for map option C set out in the supplemental memo from City Clerk Mejia. The changes to the existing districts are minimal, largely preserving the boundaries Mr. Crawford created for District 1 and its majority-minority status, while keeping neighborhood organizations intact. Only one neighborhood, Stunmore, would have to wait an additional two years for a council election. The changes to the District 5 boundaries are consistent with the map I drew in the initial districting process, bringing the Smoke Tree Shopping District frequented by District 5 residents into the district while moving the historic Tennis Club neighborhood with its proximity to downtown Palm Springs into District 3 with the rest of downtown. Both these changes reflect the community of interest analysis outlined in U.S. Supreme Court precedent. I will have more comments later in the redistricting process and expect to submit my own map, but for the moment, I support map option C. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Ed Doobie, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Good evening, council members, uh, and congratulations to the new mayor and the new mayor pro tem and the outgoing mayor and the former mayor and mayors yet to be. I hope I haven't left everyone, anybody out. Ed Doobie here. Um, I've had a chance to go in and work with the mapping tool this week. And I'd like to give a quick thank you to Stephanie Smith for a quick turnaround on my questions. Um, this is the first time that we've really had a chance to work with the new census demographic data. And I don't, I've don't. i submitted a map because I really think we're going to be able to correct the imbalances with minimal disruption to the districts. I only just got to see map option C, but let me give you some quick bullet points on the map that I presented. First. I think we'll be able to keep District 1 where combined minorities, and here I'm not just talking about race, but the communities of interest that they share. And I'd like to suggest that we 
Um, it would be helpful to have those communities of interest that were established when we did this the first time available to for the public to see. Um, they will be in majority. And in fact, the new data actually strengthens this percentage to a number that is very acceptable. Second, um, I think that we'll be able to keep the promises that we made to 1PS communities, neighborhoods, um, to rejoin neighborhoods that have been split in the first effort across the districts. In fact, it's a win-win. Shifts in rejoining neighborhoods, such as the Upper West Side, which I don't see in any of these maps, actually help reduce the current population imbalances between the districts. There's still some small areas where the census blocks don't match our present districting, but I'm happy to work with you on this. Lastly, I'd like to suggest that we align the way that we label statistics in the mapping tool to the map options that are being presented here tonight. Based on lessons learned last time, this is going to be very confusing to the community if we do this. Don't do this. And again, I think it would be extremely helpful if we're able to get the other census demographic data that we used, like what we used in the first effort. This is the socioeconomic data, income levels, non-voting population, percentage, age, all of the various things. If we can get into this further in the upcoming community meetings, I think this will be very helpful, and I plan to attend each of those meetings. That's all I have to tell you for now, and thanks again for letting me help you in this effort. Thank you. Madam Mayor, that does conclude public comment for this hearing. Uh, Kathy Warmick uh, withdrew uh, from participation. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, there being no other speakers, the public hearing is closed. Are there any additional discussion or questions from the council? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, First is, thank you so much um, for all of this and for presenting us with these different options. Um, I do wanna talk about uh, map C and I thank you for making sure that Lawrence Crossley was whole, but I also have a question about the Lawrence Crossley district because um, Mr. Priest, I'm wondering if you could just speak regarding um, the definition of contiguity and whether or not um, there has to be a road to access that area, because if you'll look, zoom in on the map of Lawrence Crossley, um, there's actually no access point there unless you take uh, 34th Avenue, which is listed as being in District 4. Uh, so if you could just speak on that. You're on mute. Sorry about that. Yes, uh, thank you, Councilmember Gardner. Um, uh, my understand no uh this does not affect contiguity the, the key is that the districts touch and share a boundary and not just you know touch at corners things like that so this would meet contiguity uh that said if because there is a different access point or a like a a vehicular barrier so to speak to lawrence crossley if the council believes that perhaps it should be assigned to District 4 um, so that it would be part of that access point, you could certainly consider that as a community of interest factor. But I don't believe that it violates contiguity just because of that road. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate that. Um, I I think it's, it's a connecting... Uh, having Lawrence Crossley in District 1 connects two historic Black districts and so or Black areas, so I think that it's important to keep together. But I just wanted to address that because I, I wasn't sure myself if what that definition was. Um, otherwise, I just wanted to, to point out a couple of things to the rest of Council and just to propose some ideas. I noticed here that um, for District 1, there's a little bit of divisions in neighborhood groups. Um, and I think that might just be something that is because of census blocks and maybe can be cleaned up. But Desert Park Estates is not kept whole by just a little sliver um, around the edges. But then um, I also, since I noticed that there are there's some wiggle room with uh, deviations, um, we also have the Giannotri neighborhood that is, that is split. 
um, into two different districts, which was the case this last time around, the, currently right now. Um, but since there is wiggle room, I would love to keep um, the Giannatri neighborhood whole in District 1. Um, I think that that's a, that's a community that um, I know that I work with quite a bit, and I think it would just make sense in terms of compactness as well. So I just wanted to, to throw that out there. Um, but that is all of my comments at this time. Other comments? Council member Halstitch. Thank you. If I could just clarify from the mayor, or from city staff, um, what direction you need at this time. I see the recommendation is to receive the report, conduct the public hearing, and then pro provide direction about the schedule of public hearings and community workshops. So do we need to decide between the accelerated and the longer schedule or and or, you know, how do you want us to give you feedback right now about the districts in the maps? If we have comments about um, communities of interest or how the map is drawn or changes we might want to see, is this the appropriate time to give that? Yes. Thank you, council member. Yes. Um, there, there's really two things. The, the main purpose of our meeting right now is soliciting comment and input from the council and the public on, do you prefer map option A, B, or C? If, if C is the preferable option, are there any things about C that you would want looked into some communities of interest that you have concerns about even in what any of the map options and want to see further refined? Uh, that, that's really the key that we're uh, going for tonight to get from the council. No final action is required tonight. This is one of several public hearings to, to move the process along. But we are really looking for that input. Once we finish talking about the maps, um, I think Mr. Mejia would like the council to entertain the possibility of an accelerated schedule again. And we can have that discussion at that time. Thank you. So I very much prefer map option C. Um, I think it's really important for us to keep a minority majority district to the extent possible. Um, and so I agree with staff that map A and B aren't um, acceptable for that reason. Um, and then I just have a few comments about district four um, and it differs from the public comment that we heard, um, but having Araby Commons and Araby Cove and Smoke Tree and especially Smoke Tree Shopping Center um, is currently in District 4. And I think that's an area that is changing to District 5 under that map. Um, I very much think that that's a community of interest with Sonora Sunrise, which I live in, and Los Compadres and our surrounding areas because those are walkable. Um, and we talked as community of interest and what those boundary lines are for the community, um, really being Sunrise, um, but not being Palm Canyon in that area. So um, I'm a little concerned to see that change just because even as a resident, I live in that area and that's within the walking distance that, you know, I travel to and go to in my neighborhood. So um, I'm interested in seeing um, what it might look like without that change. Um, and then similarly, I know that there's um, it adds, it looks like Sunmore above Talkwitz. Um, and I think that Talkwitz is really a dividing line in our community and that um, it sort of separates communities and neighborhoods and, um, and residences. So um, what you see is Sunmore um, might be more similar with the neighborhoods above it them below. And then you have Gateway there, which is above Talkwitz, but the way that it's split based on Feral, apartments on one side of Feral, which are pretty similar to the apartments on the other side of Feral, both north of Talkwitz, are separated in district, different districts. And that just doesn't quite make sense. So um, we might need to, I would personally consider or want to see moving the map south a little bit to put Sunmore or Gateway um, in those more northern districts and then maybe at considering the conversation around Araby and Araby Commons. Um, it looks like District 4 has the biggest deviation or the the, the biggest loss of residents um, in 
out of all of them. And, you know, maybe that's fine. I'm just not sure the impact of that. It's by 4.5%, I think you said. Um, so I would just be interested in the impact on that. Um, but those are my general comments about that district and the district lines having received this yesterday. Um, but I really appreciate staff asking for that map option C and very much appreciate staff bringing back the priorities and principles, because I think that's incredibly important um, to hold on to as we go through this process. And the last comments I'll say, thank you, um, is the community outreach, I think, is incredibly important. And it serves not just our goals with redistricting, but also other roles in outreach and community and civic engagement. And I think we saw so much come out of our larger process. So I do support a more truncated schedule. Um, I just want to be really thoughtful about which um, outreach meetings we're losing and which neighborhoods we might still want to be in. Like, I think we would still maybe want to do something in Duluth or one of the schools, um, thinking through who we're reaching at the convention center versus those more targeted places. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Council Member Kors. Hey, uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, so the only, you know, uh, having had the time in the last day and really do appreciate um, looking back at uh, what our goals were last time uh, and coming up with map C because I do think it keeps the most people on the same schedule they're on and um, I think makes a lot of sense. Um, one area that jumped out and obviously I'll um, I'll do my own meeting with uh, residents in district three sort of about the map but I think that uh, Movie Colony East and Movie Colony have a lot in common and, you know, share Ruth Hardy Park and a lot of the same, you know, separate, it separates them. Um, and that was moved out of three into two and three is, I think, the second lowest, close to four from the highest, I think, before. Uh, and so I don't know if that can come back um, without, you know, with keeping within the deviation, but I th that jumped out as, you know, sort of two neighborhoods that are very, have a lot of similarities um, in how they're drawn. Uh, as far as uh, the principles, I, you know, um, I think most of us were involved in this. Um, I think Council Member Woods uh, wasn't on council or on the uh, last uh, working group. So, you know, if people have other things they wanna add uh, to the principles, but I think they're good principles um, to just reiterate. And I think the importance which we really worked hard to do of having a majority minority district is uh, is essential really for us to keep because um, it was one of our primary goals. Um, and I think all the goals were good goals. And um, so I agree with uh, uh, council member uh, um, I'd like to see the truncated process. And um, I realize uh, Anthony, you can only be in so many places on the same time on the same day, but is there someone else who might be able to do a meeting or two in that period uh, to get that input, right, um, on staff or, you know, with BB and K. So we're getting the input from the community because I do think that's important, um, especially where we have some changes, right? I think uh, we only did this a few years ago, but where there are changes, I think making sure we're in a close area to that where people are comfortable going um, is important. So I'd like to do the trunc truncated, um, I want both. I want my cake, I want to eat it too. So if we can add maybe one or two more with someone else doing them, so we can get that input. And obviously if it's in a neighborhood where some of us are, we can go listen and get that input from, you know, uh, residents uh, who are impacted in our district or um, where the districts may change. But I'd, I'd like to see if we can just not do the five if we can't, but maybe add another one or two in there as a way to get there, but not wait six weeks longer, because I do think it's hard for someone. Most of us, I think, you know, announced way before like, the end of March or April, um, we were going to run for office. And I think for a non-incumbent to have to wait to that time, if they're in an area that might change, just puts them at a disadvantage. So I, I'd like to see us try and sort of get the best of both worlds if we can. And, Thank you. and Madam Mayor and, and Council, absolutely. Something that I, I did not think about is I'm thinking of it in a very formal way of community workshops that are solely focused on districting. Alternatively, I'd be happy to go to 
any existing community meetings that are already happening. So, so 1PS meetings, neighbor or individual 1PS uh, events, uh, Main Street, uh, any of those kinds of organizations between now and, and the time that we need to adopt a map, I'm happy to go to any of them, talk about the maps that we are already considering, uh, encourage them to develop their own maps, uh, and, and any of those other issues that uh, would be helpful. I, I'm thinking of it solely in the f you know very focused community kind of workshops, uh, but happy to go to any existing community workshops uh, or events. And, and of course, I can uh, get additional assistance from uh, BB and K for additional meetings that would be focused just on uh, redistricting. And Madam Mayor, if I might point out that uh, Stephanie Smith of our firm will be attending the first several workshops next week to educate and assist the public in using the mapping tool and the other uh, technology involved there to solicit input. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Woods, do you have uh, comments or questions? Uh, no, um, uh, Madam Mayor, I just, uh, I would echo some of my fellow council members in that keeping our neighborhoods as intact as possible, I think uh, is a, a good value to move forward with as we look at redistricting. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Woods, I want to echo the comments of uh, my colleagues uh, and thank uh, uh, Mr. Mejia for developing uh, map option C, which I think is uh, significantly improved over uh, the prior options of A and B. Uh, it, it minimizes the number of changes that we have. Uh, it holds together uh, the majority minority district that we are so proud of uh, having uh, created uh, and I think it stays true to the principles that we established. I would like to see us, if at all possible, uh, use the accelerated schedule, and I think it is possible. Uh, I do believe it's possible, though, because of all of the outreach and work that we did uh, in the last effort. Uh, we, we truly went above and beyond in our outreach, and now, uh, uh, I believe we've got an opportunity to receive a dividend from uh, the amount of work that went into this the last time. I would like uh, in particular, as we uh, look at these maps and look at C, where at all possible, if we can keep neighborhoods uh, on the same election cycle, so that uh, if we do have to make changes, uh, as we maximize changes between districts four and five uh, and changes between districts one, two, and three, which preserves everyone on the same cycle. Where we accelerate uh, someone on the cycle, uh, that, that gives them an opportunity to vote uh, a little earlier. Uh, something I think we should do every effort to try to avoid is uh, holding any part of our community back where they would end up voting two years later uh, than they would otherwise uh, be able to vote in. Right now, I think that's limited to the Sunmore neighborhood. Uh, and uh, I, I think the population in that neighborhood is such that we should be able to uh, uh, look at some uh, accommodation there. Uh, and, uh, uh, I, I'm very comfortable with the comments that Councilmember Holstead made regarding preserving Araby Commons and Smoke Tree. Those are communities that I would be very comfortable seeing also in, in District 5. But uh, if we can preserve districts as they are, that's a good thing. Uh, and uh, uh, District uh, 5 has worked really well with uh, the Historic Tennis Club, although uh, and it is uh, in District 3, a district that includes all of the downtown areas. And so I certainly understand the logic of bringing that uh, uh, to, with District 3. One advantage if that is a neighborhood that does have to be moved is they would be accelerated on their vote, not deaccelerated. 
Uh, but uh, I think there's some tweaking of these lines that can be done and we've only had a couple of days to take and do them. Uh, but I'm very encouraged by what I see in these maps or in map C. With that, is uh, there any, uh, if there's not any further discussion, is there a motion in a second? I'm happy to make a motion um, to move forward with directing staff to look at map C with um, continuing the priorities, um, recommendations um, that staff recommended, including um, giving direction about community workshops. So staff, let us know if you need additional recommendations. Um, but otherwise, um, including all of the discussion, um, would love to support a motion to approve map, move forward in assessing changes to map C. And this clarification, does that also include uh, attempting to move forward with the accelerated schedule? Yes, thank you. I'll second. Uh, with that, if there's no further discussion, a roll call vote, please. If I can, Madam Mayor, I just wanted to add something for discussion. Um, I know that there's a lot of annual meetings happening um, for 1PS. So, you know, I'm a little concerned in hearing Anthony, you know, I don't, I think Anthony, our city clerk, should have to be a one-man show about um, doing this work. I know how we have BBK as support, too. But I know we had really excellent volunteers with our CVA, CVRA working group, many of whom called in tonight. And I know many of whom are going to be drawing other maps and other maps for the community to consider. So I just love for us to think through working with 1PS and working with our CVRA leaders and others to help facilitate those conversations, um, because I think that's a good opportunity, especially with the annual meetings. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Mr. Uh, yes. Uh, Councilmember Holstich. Yes. Councilmember Kors. Yes. Councilmember Woods. Yes. Mayor Pro Tim Garner. Yes. Mayor Middleton. Aye. Motion passes five to zero. And I just want to uh, remind the community, please visit psdistricts.com. Uh, you can view the maps, go to our uh, interactive Google map system. Very easy to use to zoom into these maps and, and see specifics and, and street detail. And, um, and please, uh, Continue providing your comments on the map C or submit your own maps as your comments will help refine these maps to become the best maps that we can develop. Thank you. If I could get a consensus from uh, the council, would we like to proceed now to item 4A and complete that discussion and then come back uh, to council member comments and consent items or do you want to I'll move forward with council member comments at this point. I'm fine. Four A. I'd go to four A. Seeing head shake. If there, if you're going to shake your head, no, do it now. <laughs> All right. And we will move forward to item four uh, A. And I will have to get to my notes. Item 4A uh, is a review of urgent emergency orders related to COVID-19. I would like to ask for a staff report. Good evening, Madam Mayor. Congratulations. Also, congratulations, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, so what we have tonight is uh, an update regarding our current protocols for COVID-19 and keeping our community safe. And to frame that discussion, I'm going to join uh, Ms. Mrs. Sawatari, the Director of Public Health, and Dr. from Eisenhower in just sharing some information and giving an update on uh, where we sit right now uh, with COVID-19. So as we heard earlier, Coachella Valley is doing much better with vaccination uh, than most of Riverside. 
Actually, since our conversation in October, we've only seen a 1% increase in Palm Springs. Uh, much of that is attributed to children being able to get vaccinated. Uh, we were pretty close to 80% uh, at our October 28th discussion. Looking at the state's metrics, uh, a whole lot of this is going to be the same as we've been hearing. Uh, we've had a consistently uh, stagnant trend uh, since the end of September with a couple of uh, peak weeks where we see a little uptick and then a couple uh, returning back down. But really since the end of September, it's been relatively flat. A close look at Riverside County. Uh, so far we've had 379,000 cases in Riverside County. Again, over on the right, we can see for the past couple of months, it's been relatively flat. The past two weeks, there was a slight uptick, uh, but percentage-wise, it's nothing, it, it's not concerning yet. We aren't seeing the dramatic peaks that we saw uh, last year at this time. As you can see down on the bottom, I did a comparison of the holiday period last year to where we are this year. Uh, we're at about 10% of where we were this time last year. Uh, while that's still a ways off from the summer pre-surge where we were only at 328 cases a day in the county, or a week in the county, I'm sorry, uh, we are doing much better than we were this time last year. And the same holds true here in Palm Springs. Uh, we see the same trend in cases as the county level. Uh, we did have a slight increase over the, the past couple of weeks, and I'll show that when we get to the Coachella Valley slide. Uh, the, the, it's not indicative of a surge. We went from 44 cases the week before last to 60. So while that is an increase, it's not uh, the dramatic spikes that we saw this time last year. And we're really hoping that we just continue to see this trend of very small increases as we go through the winter months and the holiday season uh, and, and remain relatively flat over the next you know, two months, hopefully. As I said, here in the Coachella Valley, there's been an uptick over the past four weeks. Uh, it's been incremental, uh, not extreme, nothing like we saw uh, last uh, Halloween into Thanksgiving and ultimately into Christmas. So really all, all this is indicating to us is that we need to continue monitoring this situation uh, and, and hope that we don't see those dramatic increases. Uh, the same, same trend uh, for the wastewater treatment. This is going back to when we started uh, in August of 2020, and you can see the, the very clear peak that we had last winter season. Um, and then on the far right, the past several months has been, uh, as messy as it looks, that's, that's relatively flat. Uh, it's been the stagnation in cases. We've had about uh, 40 cases per week here in the city for the past couple of months. And like I said, last week we went from 44 to 60. And the last 90 days really lets you see that picture. And on the right, we have one outlier week uh, that was actually the week before Thanksgiving. So there, there's no real understanding on why that, that particular weekend we had a, basically a, a doubling in, in viral load, but it was the week before Thanksgiving. So we consider an outlier. So the trend for the past three months has been uh, consistently you know, flat. As I said, I have a comparison. This is this year for the past, uh, since the end of September compared to last year. Uh, 2020 is in red and 2021 is in blue. And you can see for the past several months, we've been higher than we were uh, going into October. And then as we exit October into December, uh, last year we had that, that incredible, incredibly dramatic increase uh, in cases that led to, to the surge uh, of the, the pandemic. Uh, and this is GT Molecular going back the past six weeks. Again, the cases are remaining relatively flat. Uh, we did have the outlier week, uh, but nothing to indicate that we're having a surge. We are having a, seeing an uptick, as uh, both the other speakers said earlier. We're anticipating increases in cases over the next few weeks, both because of the holiday season and going into winter as people gather inside. Uh, as well as uh, the Omicron variant, which was discussed earlier. And I'll try to not uh, belabor the point since we already discussed it. If there's any questions, uh, I'm happy to answer any that weren't asked earlier. Uh, it's just, it's another variant that was discovered the day after Thanksgiving. So a lot is unknown about the Omicron variant at this time. And 
the who and all around the world doctors are just you know waiting and seeing uh, trying to figure out what this means for the pandemic overall uh, and again, as you heard earlier, the CDC and CDPH haven't changed any of their guidance as far as vaccination or testing or masks. Uh, it's been very consistent, even with the development of the Omicron variant. Uh, they're not recommending anything new or loosening any, any of their guidances. And a close, this is what we have in Palm Springs still, masks inside, proof of vaccination or negative COVID test to dine indoors, go to bars. Uh, large ticketed events and city staff. Uh, we are continuing to work on uh, a testing program for city staff. I've spoken with my counterparts throughout the Coachella Valley. None of our uh, sister cities here in the Valley have plans to make any changes prior to uh, the new year. Uh, everybody here in the Valley is kind of in a holding pattern of waiting and seeing both what happens with the holiday season as well as the Omicron variant. Uh, the the only other changes that we've seen uh, in November, on November 4th, LA made a change uh, requiring proof of vaccination. Uh, at, I'm sorry, the employees must be vaccinated for LA City, and they are recommending any returning travelers uh, anywhere where Omicron is present uh, to quarantine and test as soon as possible. Uh, San Francisco has not made any changes. They are not planning to loosen or tighten any restrictions uh, prior to the new year. Uh, and New York City uh, did make an update on November 29th. Uh, now everybody must wear a mask indoors at all times, uh, as we heard from the doctor uh, earlier in the meeting. Uh, that is all I have for your update, if there's any questions. Are there any questions for uh, Mr. DeSelms? Sure. Thank Rick? you, Danny. Really good report. Yeah. Ah. Council member Kors. Sure. And uh, thank you, Danny, for that update and uh, the information. And I know the staff report talked about, you know, obviously we have lots of options. Um, do you have a recommendation? You're on all the calls with public health officials. Uh, it was good to have two with us tonight uh, for us in the public. But your sense from what you're hearing, obviously, the other cities in the valley don't have these rules and the other cities you listed have stricter rules. So I'm just trying to get your sense of this. Uh, my professional opinion is that uh, I would recommend waiting uh, through this winter season. Uh, winter season is historically a time when there's more uh, endemic disease pops up, the flu season, more people get sick in the winter time, as well as the holidays bringing people closer, more travel, there's just a lot of things bringing people together. So increased potential for sickness there, as well as the Omicron variant. So I would recommend keeping everything in place and wait and see how things look uh, towards the end of January that we have uh, a, a cycle after Christmas and New Year's to see what has happened, how how, th how the numbers look uh, towards the end of January. Great, and one other question, which is um, from Thanksgiving, and I know we were at 44 and I think 36 the week before that, and now it's 60, but would we be seeing the cases from the Thanksgiving in those numbers yet? Because I saw something, um, which I forgot, sorry to ask uh, the director from Riverside, that those numbers would start coming 12 to 15 days after Thanksgiving. So. Do you have any more information on that? Because we're just approaching that now. So do the numbers you reported, you think, include things that happened in Thanksgiving? Or are we getting it now? Just what's the timing on that? So the general incubation period is 4 to 14 days. So we look for the, the numbers uh, about 10 to 15 days post any event uh, to consider them as part of that event. So when we look at Thanksgiving, the numbers that I report to uh, to staff and council next week will be the first time that we will be uh, accurately reflecting numbers from the Thanksgiving uh, weekend. Okay, got it. Thank you. That's helpful. Other questions uh, for Danny or uh, Council Member Halsich? Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
I'd like to make a motion to move staff recommendation to continue the rules as is um, and then review changes to the current protocols and policies at the January 27th meeting. I'm happy to have further discussion and hear from all the council members. Um, but, you know, we've heard from a number of stakeholders. We've had meetings. Um, council member Kors and I attended PISA board m meetings, GM breakfast, many others of people in the industry. And we heard concerns and problems, but also um, a concern about the future uh, and you know, keeping businesses open and keeping people safe, residents, workers, um, and visitors. So personally, in hearing all the evidence, I'd like to see the restrictions remain as is. Um, so in the interest of time, I wanted to make a motion and see if there's a second, and then we can discuss the details uh, within the context of that. Sure. I'll second that. All right. We have a motion and second. Is there a further discussion? Or Mayor Pro Tem uh, Garner. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just wanted to raise that the just the same issue that you know we're coming against is that the the businesses that are not in our downtown are having a harder time with this. Um, and it's impacting their business a little bit more because they don't have that constant flow of people coming in. Um, I understand where the council is going with this and staff's recommendation, of course. And so, but I just want to make sure that I raise that for them because um, we've heard from them as well. Um, but I think out of an abundance of caution um, and it's important, but I, and, but I do want us to also take heed of what the doctor said earlier, that these are kind of short-term solutions and we have to figure out what we're going to do long-term about this. Um, so I would like us at that January 27th meeting to be able to really discuss where do we go from here and how do we make sure that we're encouraging people to get vaccinated? Because that's my concern as well, is that um, even though, you know, the hope was that as well, part of the hope in, in making these uh, restrictions would that we also increase the number of people getting vaccinated. Um, but I've also seen a lot of people just digging their heels into the ground um, instead of actually being open to the conversation of getting vaccinated. So I want us at, you know, at that next meeting to be able to kind of discuss a little bit more of um, how do we boost our vaccination numbers and how do we bring in those people that are, are a little bit um, still scared or, or maybe have other reasons for why they don't um, want to get vaccinated because uh, ultimately more vaccination a number higher vaccination numbers is what's going to be the best thing overall for for everyone um, but I, I can support this certainly today are there other comments uh, council member of course sure uh, just some of the um, from the GM breakfast from uh, PS resorts and from Palm Springs hospitality uh, you know, there's one hotel who didn't agree with the rules, but appreciated that we want to keep everyone safe. So I just want to share that. It wasn't unanimous. There was one restaurant on the Hospitality Association who, you know, generally has supported the rules, but feels is concerned that um, some restaurants aren't following it and uh, said they understand we've done some enforcement. Um, and I think it's complaint based, but I said I would ask the city manager to explain what we're doing. And if people are seeing that, because one restaurant also told me customers say that, but they're like, they don't think it's necessarily anything other than the customer wanting to get in that other restaurants do it. But, you know, someone did say they went to two restaurants that didn't do it, a different restaurant. So just what we're doing on enforcement, um, right? It's not our, um, you know, we're trying to deal with crime and other issues uh, first and foremost, but I think we do respond and there have been fines. So I said I would ask the city manager just to share that publicly because they feel the public doesn't know and they don't know that anything is happens if you call code enforcement. I'm happy to chime in quickly, Mayor and Council, that we have, in fact, um, re been responding to complaints, especially where we get multiple complaints at the same location. We have conducted investigations. We have issued citations. And even in instances where um, I've been personally asked to reverse citations, um, where there was substantial evidence that there was kind of knowing violation of the, the rules, we've stuck to our guns uh, and the enforcement action there and, and maintained fines. So uh, I don't think we've got a lot of those calls recently so certainly 
residents are encouraged to call us if they do see those kinds of violations. Uh, the only other thing, uh, and there was one restaurant who said because they tend to have larger groups, they are it is having some impact in, on the hospitality association. That, but they also have shared that they have a lot of workers who don't want to get vaccinated, um, and they prefer we keep these in place, uh, not forever, but until we see what happens over the holiday season. Even though it may cost them some business, um, and I know that's hard for folks. I don't want to acknowledge, you know, that challenge uh, that some people have. Others said they're having record years, right? And I think to Councilmember Garner, there's it's a mix of um, what's happening. Uh, so we want to be conscious of that, uh, uh, you know, and, and appreciate, you know, that this you know, does add something, uh, you know, to it. Um, the only other comments we got uh, were that, you know, vacation rentals and hotels let people coming here know about the rules. Um, obviously, people coming from, you know, our major drive market in L.A., they have much stricter rules, so they're aware um, in San Francisco, but other people may not be. Uh, the vacation rental industry shared they put it in their contracts and they're posting it. Um, and the hotel said they're posting it. But um, just encouraged to ask our um, lodging uh, folks to make sure guests know before they come here so they don't show up somewhere with an indoor reservation and are surprised. So, you know, if we could maybe send a reminder out to them to let their guests know, I think that would be appreciated as well. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Are there other comments? Uh, let me add uh, a few. I had the opportunity to uh, meet with uh, the Main Street merchants uh, earlier this week and uh, received a number of really good comments. Uh, generally, the retailers uh, were very supportive of continuing the mask requirements. What was the most uh, uh, debated subject was whether or not uh, the requirement of showing proof of vaccination before entering a restaurant was one that was truly effective and that was uh, uh, being uh, consistently followed throughout uh, the city. Uh, and certainly some concerns on the part of uh, some restaurateurs that uh, they're uh, carrying a disproportionate uh, share of the responsibility for responding uh, uh, to this uh, it, pandemic. So I, uh, I'm going to second the comments of Mayor Pro Tem Garner that as we start to move forward into uh, late January, uh, that we do take a good look at whether or not, uh, in particular, uh, the requirement for a vaccination uh, to enter a restaurant is one that is working. Uh, but given uh, just how bad uh, things were last December and January, uh, prudence tells me that we should uh, retain these restrictions uh, in place uh, for at least uh, another uh, uh, now approximately seven weeks that would take us to the January 27th. Uh, city council meeting. So I'm going to support uh, moving forward with that. Uh, I'm also going to make uh, somewhat of a personal uh, comment. One of my questions to the public health director had to do with uh, vaccination uh, demand. And uh, we all need to be careful when it's a one-off event. Uh, but I had a vaccination scheduled at one of our local pharmacies. I showed up on time. I stood in line behind 18 other people. At 30 minutes, the line had not moved by a single person. That pharmacy also had, at that time, uh, because I counted when I left the pharmacy after 30 minutes, a dozen cars waiting in its uh, uh, drive up pharmacy window. Every customer who needed to visit the pharmacy, whether they were there for a uh, vaccination shot that had been scheduled to drop off a prescription or to uh, pick up a prescription was in the same line. Uh, I went back to that pharmacy the next day. Uh, I didn't go in, but I counted 13 cars uh, in the drive up window, which would have also been the same farm uh, individuals that were 
responsible for providing shots. I counted when the evening that I was there, two people, one the pharmacist and one an incredibly hairy assistant working. Uh, I think we need, if we're going to make vaccination something that everyone needs to do, we need to make sure that the experience, such as the experience of people who went to the convention center to get their vaccinations earlier this year, is one that's a positive experience. And unfortunately, uh, based on my own experience, I have some real questions as to whether or not uh, the for-profit entities uh, are more interested in having an opportunity uh, to uh, bring in income through providing vaccinations than providing a positive uh, experience for individuals seeking a vaccination. And I would ask staff uh, to work with uh, the uh, public health officials so that uh, we have a clear public option uh, for individuals to receive a vaccination in Palm Springs. Uh, lastly, since it got some attention earlier today, I was insulted not once but twice when it came to uh, my gender during the course of the 45 minutes that I spent at that pharmacy in my city. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, is there a, we have a motion and a second. Can we get a roll call vote, please? Council Member Holstich. Yes. Council Member Coors. Yes. Council Member Woods. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Gardner. Yes. Mayor Middleton. Aye. Motion passes five to zero. With that, uh, Ma Mayor and Council. If I could, please, one of the items that has been discussed in recent meetings is the possibility of returning to in-person here at Chambers. So I just want to get some additional clarification. If we are maintaining status quo with some of the other mask wearing and proof of vaccination restrictions, should we anticipate any change uh, to these or other public meetings? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Clifton. Comments from uh, council members? Hey, um, I feel like the virtual meetings allow um, several, of, a lot of the public to participate in a safe manner by being able to call in and we, they can read our facial expressions without having to wear a mask, like if we're in chambers, um, which I think is important, smiles and nods and all of that. So um, whether we go to a hybrid or keep this, I would be open to either, but I think it's allowing a lot of people to safely participate in our meetings. Other comments? Uh, Council Member Kors. Yeah, uh, I agree. I would obviously like us to be back in person and I'd like us not to need to wear masks. Um, but I think given um, until our second meeting in January, I think for those two meetings, we should continue this and then we'll have that discussion as long with the rules. I think for all, for five of us to be in with masks, I, I do think it impacts people being able to see us are in our expressions. Uh, but if some people want to be in chambers with mass, you know, we could do a hybrid. We've done that when someone's been out. So. Council member Mostich. Thank you. I really support at least a hybrid model. I know that we've heard that there's barriers to only using Zoom because people can't show up and, or excuse me, they can't use technology in that way. They don't have access, you know, all kinds of issues. So I very much do support um, moving to a hybrid model in the future where people can come in person and give public comment, whether we're there now or not, you know, I don't know. Um, but I do just want to say out loud that I think it's important to provide a place for the public to go to give comment. Um, and I think, you know, being in chambers, I think is my preference um, because it's just, I think we do better business when we're in person and not on the computer. Um, but I'm happy to stay on Zoom for as long as council feels safe. Um, but I do think most councils have moved to being in chambers or some never stopped at all. 
uh, which we're glad that we we've been safe this whole time, but, um, I am anxious to get off zoom personally. I am anxious to get, uh, go ahead and council member Garner or mayor pro tem Garner, excuse me. Thank you. Um, no, I, I just want to agree that I, I would prefer to be in person and, um, but I also want us to make sure that we're following our own rules. Um, so that might mean limiting the number of people in the room in order for us to be able to be a fully vaccinated group without masks, if that's possible. I'm trying to think of the details of our rules <laughs> um, and whether or not that's allowed. But um, I, I do think that it, it helps for sure to for participation. Um, and I, I would agree as well to be able to allow some people to come in person to make comments and we might have to modify that as well. Maybe they can't stay for the whole meeting, um, but if they can come and give comment, if, if they need to or want to, that could be useful. Thank you. I agree. I, I would like to get back to, uh, to chambers as soon as we can. I think uh, it is appropriate for us to uh, through uh, January 27, which is the dates we were continuing the restrictions that we uh, stay consistent. Uh, at the time that we're able to loosen the restrictions uh, on the public as a whole, uh, that seems to me an appropriate time for us to look very seriously at what can we do to return into uh, chambers in a safe fashion. Uh, Mr. City Manager, does that give you the direction you needed? Uh, Mayor and Council, what I heard is uh, a lack of clear majority to make any changes. So I think uh, we would maintain the status quo at least until the January 27th meeting when this item returns for further discussion. Thank you. So with that, we will come back to uh, the uh, early part of our agenda, and it is time for City Council, Subcommittee, uh, and City Manager comments and reports. Are there comments from uh, Council members? And I know she already teed it up that uh, Council Member Holstage would like to talk about the last year and all the many things that were done very well in the last year. Thank you, Mayor. I would just, in the interest of time, um, like to ask Council perhaps that I could do a short or work with staff to do a short presentation about all of our achievements over the last year as a Council. I think we move so rapidly, and especially with social media, you know, people are constantly asking us what we do. Um, and we've actually, if you compile a list with my count, which my council fellow worked on. Um, it's really incredible what we've done just in a year. And I just like the opportunity to present that. Um, but I would prefer to do it at an upcoming council meeting in January um, instead of tonight. Very good. Are there other council member uh, comments? All right. Uh, Mr. City Manager, do you have any comments from you? Uh, yes, Mayor and Council, just a couple of things quickly. One, I do want to advise members of our community that we have had a couple of sessions recently to do some visioning and strategic planning work. Um, I thought those were very productive sessions. Staff is in the process now of uh, compiling a lot of the notes that were given uh, primarily to me to um, outline those strategic plan priorities and also complete some kind of work plan level documents that will really help articulate where we'll be spending our time moving forward for the next year and beyond. So we'll be presenting that likely at least the beginnings of it um, at a meeting in January. And then I also just wanted to highlight that at the staff level and including some council members, we've had numerous uh, community type meetings with stakeholders concerning uh, homeless issues. I know that's something that um, almost everybody in the community experiences somewhere along the way. Um, you know, some of the secondary impacts, there have certainly been reports of aggressive behavior and, and drug use and other things. So want to remind the community that we are kind of on parallel tracks right now with short term and long term strategies. In the short term, we've really done a lot to invest in new uh, service provider partnerships, expanded financial uh, commitments to wraparound services. Um, we've taken other actions administratively. We've invested substantially in additional private security. In fact, to the point, 
where the labor shortages that we have here in Palm Springs, like we have across the country, are really the only thing getting in the way of full deployment there. Um, we've adopted some administrative policies that give us some additional discretion uh, to try to reduce the significant obstructions and things that we sometimes see at sidewalks. And um, we've closed Bristow Park. Uh, for cleanup and added security detail there. Um, we've been convening meetings of our service providers and have really good ideas on how to work toward a more integrated service delivery model. And of course, the most substantial progress we've made is to um, enter into a contract to purchase property to build a navigation center, which would be a housing first solution with really even more comprehensive wraparound services. That does two really important things. One, it, it acts as um, a, a lower barrier to entry to get some of these important services, but it also enables us to enact other policies throughout the community enforcement related policies, whereby we can say, um, for instance, that uh, we can limit camping um, outdoors and public spaces if in fact we have shelter space available for people to go. So just wanna emphasize that we're hearing the community uh, speak. We've been attending those meetings, including um, one organized by South Palm Canyon area businesses. We'll continue to create some resident working groups and other opportunities to strategize with community members uh, because we all should be empowered to help solve this problem. Uh, but just want to outline some of the things that we have going on currently. And that's all I have. Thank you. I want to compliment uh, our police department, our city manager, and all of the staff that were involved in that community meeting and of the merchants in the South Palm Canyon area. I heard from individuals that were present. They were very pleased with uh, the response that they received from our staff. Uh, this was a uh, meeting that was initiated by our community uh, and they deserve tremendous amount of uh, compliments and appreciation for uh, bringing us together. Uh, if I could add just one comment repeatedly as I understand it, as individuals raised issues regarding uh, law enforcement and our enforcement of our laws, Police department was absolutely on top of every one of the issues uh, that were raised. Uh, unfortunately, there are uh, laws that make it extremely difficult for uh, law enforcement to do some of the things that many of our merchants and residents would like them to do uh, when it comes to uh, the use of, uh, of illegal drugs, but illegal drugs within a level that based on laws passed by the people of California uh, in initiatives uh, restrict what, uh, what felony, what uh, penalties uh, can be paid. Thank you again to our staff, to our police department. Uh, with that, uh, the next item uh, is, is uh, the consent calendar, and we have already uh, gotten a consent calendar with nothing removed other than that on item 1M, uh, as in Mesquite, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Garner and Council Member uh, Holstage have uh, recused themselves for uh, potential financial reasons. Is there a motion to approve the consent calendar? So moved. Second. I'll second. Roll call, please. Council Member Holstech. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Gardner. Yes. Council Member Coors. Yes. Council Member Woods. Yes. Mayor Middleton. Aye. Motion passes five to zero with the notation of the recusal of Council Member Gardner. I'm sorry, Mayor Pro Tem Gardner and Council Member Holstech on item one M. Thank you. Well, thank you. And we are making progress. Uh, Mr. Mejia, as I understand it, we're moving to item two B. Am I correct? Yes. All right. The next item is item 2B, consideration of a tentative track map for the construction of 24 condominium project at 305 West San Rafael Road. Uh, I would like to ask staff for a staff report. Madam Mayor and members of council. The item before you this evening is a request for approval of a tentative map 
And I'm happy to report that this is going to be the last tentative map that you see here at the council level. With recent changes to our architectural review and entitlement process, tentative maps going forward will be approved at the planning commission level. Uh, this item was submitted before the changes took effect in our new ordinance, and so therefore this is uh, the last one that you will see. With that, the project before you is a request for approval for a tentative track map for a 24-unit development that will be located on West San Rafael Road. Just going to the visuals of the project on the left shows a site plan for the project. It involves the construction of 24 condominium units. These will be in one-story buildings. Parking for the development will be on both ends with a central uh, pedestrian passageway in between the units themselves, which will be shaded and landscaped. Uh, images on the right show the interior uh, pedestrian walkway between the units. And then this is a uh, 3D model of the project, again, showing the layout. In terms of the history of the project, this was originally approved by the Planning Commission back in 2016. The applicant prepared construction documents. Those were submitted to our Building and Safety Division, uh, but permits were not issued for the project, and ultimately those entitlements expired in 2019. The applicant wished to uh, gain approval for the project again and resubmitted the applications to our department in uh, 2021, earlier this year. The uh, architectural approval for the project was approved by the Planning Commission back in October. In terms of the findings that are necessary relative to the tentative track map, uh, the proposed map is consistent with the requirements of the Subdivision Map Act and is also consistent with the city's general plan and zoning code. Uh, based on those findings, the Planning Commission has recommended approval and staff does recommend approval of this project at this time. With that, Madam Mayor, that concludes my presentation to you. This is a public hearing. The applicant is available via Zoom if there are questions, and I am also available to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Are there any questions for staff? Uh, Councilman or Mayor Pro Tem Garner. I just had one question about density because um, this project has only a few units. And so I wanted to find out what our um, ability is to have higher density in this area or for this project rather. In terms of whether or not the council can require greater density for this project, the general plan designation for this particular site is mixed use, which allows either commercial or residential uses, and it allows a density of up to 15 units to the acre. Uh, so the project is in conformance with the city's general plan relative to density, so we don't have the ability to require uh, a greater number of units. In other residential districts in the city, however, there are density thresholds as well as maximum limits. So as we get into single and multifamily uh, areas within the city relative to the general plan, those sometimes have a density threshold or a lower limit that must be met. Uh, so consequently, unfortunately, relative to this case, we aren't able to require greater density, but in other districts of the city and residential districts of the city, we do have density minimums uh, that projects must meet in order to be in compliance. As a, as a follow-up, if I may, um, so is that something that we could change at another time for other projects? I know we've been talking about that density issue um, with the general plan. So I'm just curious kind of how, how that works and what that process would be. But then also um, what are, if, if even though we can't require more density, could we request more density or ask the developer if they would be willing to, rather. Yes, I think in certain situations you could request more density uh, in terms of looking at the development entitlement process. Uh, it would probably fall more likely to the Planning Commission rather than the City Council in terms of our 
review process. Going back to the question about what can we do to get greater density in certain areas of the general plan, we are in the process of doing an update to our general plan already. We've seen a draft version of the housing element. One of the things that you as the city council will see here in the new year is revisions to the city's land use element. And at that point in time, we can look at issues of density and that would be your opportunity to make corrections where it may be appropriate to do so. Other questions for staff? Uh, Council Member Holstich. Thank you. Thank you to Mayor Pro Tem Garner for asking that question because I had the same one. Um, and then I have a question. This is in the College Park specific plan and it talks about compliance with that. Can you just detail what that means uh, for the council and the public? Certainly. So as you've indicated, this is also within the boundaries of a specific plan area. In the College Park specific plan, uh, it was developed back in 2010 when the College of the Desert was going to be coming to the northern area of town. As part of that, we made some changes to land use designations in those area, in that area to encourage certain uses that would be supportive of a college campus. In looking specifically at this site, it did call for residential uses. And so in terms of being in compliance, it's in compliance with the uses specified in the College Park specific plan, as well as the density for those residential uses. And so as we talk about being in conformance with the College Park specific plan, it is in conformance to both use and density. So the fact that College of the Desert is no longer building a campus there and the needs for the specific plan might be different, is that now outdated or is that just something we deal with in the general plan and zoning updates? As you've indicated, it is uh, outdated at this point in time with the College of the Desert not intending to build a campus in that location. Staff has already begun the effort to engage a consultant to look at making modifications to the College Park specific plan, uh, and we will be doing that here in the new year and engaging residents of that area in the update of that plan. Thank you. There are other questions for staff? Uh, seeing none, uh, at this time I would like to open the public hearing. The applicant will have up to five minutes to provide their testimony and the public is invited to speak on this public uh, hearing for up to two minutes. If there are other speakers, the applicant will be invited to provide a rebuttal for up to two minutes. Are there, Mr. Mr. Mejia, are there any speakers uh, uh, either for the applicant or uh, public speakers on this item? I believe the applicant will be joining us via Zoom. So if we could have that person admitted and we don't have any other public comment at this time. And, and Mr. Applicant, if you could reduce the volume or turn off the volume or the uh, live stream, thank you. Done. And uh, Applicant, I'm sorry, uh, Jerome, you have um, up to five minutes to provide your comments and you can begin. Uh, good evening. My name is Jerome Belayo. I'm the applicant uh, for this project. Um, I don't have too much to add. I thought that was a, a good overview of uh, what we're proposing. Um, yeah, I did want to mention that we made every effort to propose a by right project uh, and to comply with the guidelines outlined in the general plan. Um, they, they did request uh, single story units uh, arranged into interior courtyards. Um, so even if we wanted to increase density, the fact that they wanted only single story uh, units uh, really wouldn't allow for that much more. Um, we also wanted to be respectful of the, the neighborhood by proposing uh, single story units uh, to keep a low profile uh, along San Rafael, which is a busy road, uh, and also be respectful of the neighbor's privacy in the back of the property. Um, during the, um, the planning hearing, 
uh, the neighbors did want to make sure that we didn't encroach on their privacy. So uh, I think they were they were happy with uh, what we're proposing. Um, I'd also like to highlight the fact that we significantly exceed the open space requirement. Um, we're at 65% versus the 50%, uh, which means less concrete and more landscaping on site, which is uh, really important to us. Um, so we really just try to be very thoughtful about how we laid everything out uh, and designed the project. And um, hopefully that's uh, reflected in what we saw tonight. So um, thanks for your time. Uh, thank you. Uh, and, and Madam Mayor, uh, there is no other public comment. Thank you. There being no other speakers, the public hearing is now closed. Is there any further discussion or additional questions from Council? Uh, Council Member Hostage. I saw Mayor Pro Tem Garner first. Mayor Pro Tem, if you'd like Sorry. to go first. Mayor Fine. Um, just a question. Thank you so much for answering those questions. Um, I am curious in terms of density, if there's an interest or willingness to do more density, even if you were to keep it one story, Xander, that does make sense that there are adjoining neighbors who are in single family homes. Um, but I noticed that, you know, you have uh, 1800 plus square feet um, condos and uh I mean, certainly that's quite large for, for a condo. Um, so if there's any possibility of creating a, a few smaller units or um, to add density that way. Thank you. Um, yeah, one thing I wanted to touch on is that the, the way the homes and parking areas are laid out um, create an acre of communal space in the center. And that's what we're most proud of, um, giving residents an opportunity to walk through beautifully landscaped areas and interact more with one another, uh, more than neighbors typically do. So that was a really a big goal for us for people to spend more time together and and um, to have this beautifully landscaped space in the center of everything. So um, I think at this point to to redesign will be you know almost starting from scratch and and we really see a great opportunity to to do something fresh and and beautiful and um, you know we feel very strongly about that. Council member Halster. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm sorry, I didn't want to step on Mayor Pro Temp's toes. Uh, thank you to the applicant for being here tonight. Um, in your presentation, you said they wanted single story. I wasn't sure the they that you're referring to. Oh, sorry. I was, I was just saying in the specific plan, um, it's actually in the staff report um, that, that their preference was for single story. Um, so that's what I was referring to. In the college park specific plan, yes, and this isn't a question to the applicants, the comment to staff. You know, this is the problem that we have outdated specific plans that are requiring our having preferences for lower density than you know R2, which is the zoning, um, and the mixed use in the density in the general plan. So, um, you know, to have those conflicts, I think, is harmful as we see, um, again old outdated preferences for low density um, in a way that just doesn't align with the city's you know future I think housing needs and goals. Um, I just have a few more questions for the applicant if I can. Um, you said that there's open space in the center of the community and that sounds really wonderful. Mm -hmm. Is that open to the public or is it gated? How does that work? Yeah so so this was touched on at the at the, the planning meeting. Um, so it is gated and I know it has a bit of a stigma to it these days, but again, you know, our goal is to have people in the center of this, uh, this project interacting. Uh, it's, it's a family friendly environment for kids and for dogs. And the gates are actually more to keep people in than it is to keep people out. Um, so we discussed that during the planning meeting and uh, the resolution was that we were going to have self-closing gates um, but that would only be locked at night. So during the day, they're, they're, they're unlocked. So that, that was the compromise we reached. Thank you. So it's a gate around the park area, not a gate around the community, or are there both? Yeah, so there, there are no gates around the parking areas. So, so people can drive in. There would just be two gates. And then there, there are two gates along um, uh, San Rafael, but those are only for the fire department. Right. 
So members, people who aren't members of the community, can they still go to that park or is it just a amenity for those residents? Right. So it is, it is unlocked during the day. Right. And then um, what's the price point of the condos? Um, low 700s. Are you including any affordable units? No. Thank you. I don't have any other questions, Madam Mir. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? Um, Council Member Kors. This is maybe more for staff. So um, for Flynn, how does... Um, so the gates as they're laid out here um, fit in with our rules about no gates. So the language in the general plan relative to gating of communities talks about perimeter gates around the exterior of the property. Uh, in this particular instance, the property itself is not gated, but the interior courtyard area is. Uh, so it technically is in conformance with our general plan. Uh, as we have looked at those requirements and as Planning Commission has considered projects, uh, they've been doing things more often, such as was described here, where the gates must remain open during the day so it's accessible to pedestrians <coughs> and bicycles, and then the uh, property or the HOA may lock those in the evening for security purposes. Um, so in terms of the gates, it does comply with the language that we have in the general plan currently. Planning Commission is taking a more active role to ensure that pedestrian and bicycle access remains open in such situations. Thank you. Any other comments? Is there a motion? I would move staff recommendation. Is there a second? I will second staff recommendation. Uh, Council member Kors. Uh, so are there, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have this up because I was trying to watch the presentation, although I have a staff report on my computer. Um, so are there set hours when the gates have to be open Flynn, that are a condition here? We do have a condition of approval. I'm sorry, I don't have it right in front of me right now. It's sunrise, sunset. Okay. That's correct. So in terms of the motion made by the Planning Commission, the pedestrian gates are to be unlocked from sunup to sundown and be self-closing. discussion I, I would oops, sorry <clears throat> I would just like to say that I've gotten the letters of support from the surrounding communities to um, um, for this project and this looks to me to be a very attractive project that will uh, provide uh, 24 new homes to uh, uh, individuals that uh, are looking for new homes in our community. Council member Halstage. Thank you. I appreciate that. And thank you to the applicant. Um, I don't have renderings, but it sounds like a beautiful project. Um, I I think my comments more are policy perspective, um, separate and apart from this project. Um, but this is the problem that we face is that we have outdated specific plans and they, I think that might mean city staff um, or others involved um, back then are, you know, recommending lesser density than what our general plan um, allows for, or even, you know, has identified um, even in our housing elements. And so um, 
sorry to the applicant for having this conversation right now. Um, but I think that it just shows, you know, we've said again and again, uh, most of our open land and parcels are going to luxury condos um, that are often $700,000 to $1 million. And so not that we don't want those um, in our community. We very much do. Thank you to the applicant for their investment in our community. We obviously want a mix of housing um, and we're just not getting it. Um, and so I just would love for us to look and see what we can do to spur and include um, more types of housing and denser housing. Um, and, you know, of course the neighbor's are always going to fight density. Um, but if we have, if we need, if we have, if we're going to develop and get the amount of housing we need in the city, we just have to um, talk about having more density. So um, I just wanted to share those comments because those are my, to the applicant, if I have an upset face on um, that's why uh, is because that's the policy um, problem that we're facing in the city of Palm Springs. And it's good problems um, because we have um, continued you know, beautiful luxury developments. Um, but I just needed to make that comment on the record. Uh, council member Kors. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to add, I really, I appreciate um, you bringing the project forward and following the rules that I don't think the majority of us agree should be there. Um, and so, um, you know, I'm not, not going to support that based on that fact because you, followed the rules, but I do sort of just want to echo what um, Council Member Holstedge is. I think we've all, we've given direction on the need for density. And I think giving the Planning Commission and Council leeway to allow greater density in housing, even if it's optional, if it does not comply, there has some way to do that because there are applicants and you don't have to say what you would have done. If they knew they had the opportunity to build denser housing, um, very well might have. And we will never be able to build the housing we're required to under state law in the next decade and that we all want to see built and keep the open space we want to keep from an open space perspective if we keep on getting projects like this. So not at all your fault. Um, I think it looks like it'll be a beautiful project, but we have to come up sooner rather than later um, and get that tackled. So um, I didn't want to say I will vote for that, but I want it on the record. Um, if we had different rules, I might not. So, uh, but uh, thank you for um, investing in the city. Uh, Council member Woods. Yeah, I think they're all very good points. Um, I do agree that the developer followed the rules, has gone through the process and, and, and done everything. Um, maybe the direction to staff is to see if we can't dissolve that specific plan uh, since we really don't know um, where COD is going at this point with the, the property north of there, or at least we look at the specific plan um, along with when we do the general plan, if not sooner. Are there any other comments or uh, we to time for the vote? Uh, roll call, please. Council Member Woods. Uh, yes. Mayor Holstech. I'm sorry, Mayor, Mayor Middleton. Hi. Council Member Holstech. Yes. Council Member Coors. Yes. Mayor Pro Tim Middleton. <laughs> Mayor Pro <laughs> Tim Gardner. <laughs> it's all new. It's okay. Yes. <laughs> Motion passes five to zero. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, we have reached uh, nine o'clock, which is usually the hour that we. Uh, shift to uh, public comments on non-agenda items. Uh, Mr. Mejia, do we have any uh, public comments on non-agenda items? Uh, we do not tonight. Okay. Uh, Council, is it your preference to uh, take a break or to uh, proceed? Uh, I see one head shaking yes. yes. Why don't we take a 10 minute break? Thank you.
are back from uh, our break, uh, and we went a little over 10 minutes, but uh, most of you are used to that by now. Uh, so the next item is 2C, to consider a development agreement with Desert Aids Project to vest certain development rights for the term of 10 years and a timeline for construction associated with the addition of a new 18,500 square foot medical office building pavilion to be located at 1695 North Sunrise Way. I'd like to ask for a staff report. Madam Mayor and members of council, the next item on your agenda this evening is relative to a development agreement for the Desert AIDS Project. In terms of the request, this is relative to the expansion of the office and medical campus. As indicated, it's for a period of 10 years, and it also addresses the timing of certain improvements to Sunrise Way along the frontage of the Desert AIDS Project property. The request for the development agreement is relative to the funding for the expansion of the campus as the Desert AIDS Project relies on fundraising efforts for much of their capital projects. Uh, they wanted to guarantee that the entitlements would still be valid and in place once they're ready to begin construction. In terms of the history, the expansion of their campus was approved by the City Council in December of last year, so just last year, 12 months ago. Uh, in January of 2021, they came forward with a development agreement for the Coachella Valley Housing Coalition and the development of their housing component. Uh, and then in September of this year, the final development plans for the housing component was approved by the Planning Commission. So that part of the project is well underway. As I had mentioned, the development agreement for the housing component, uh, as you look at the overall campus here shown on the map, the housing component is there circled in red, and uh, that is underway. And then what is being proposed before you this evening is a development agreement for the expansion of the office and medical, uh, which is shown here within the circled area on the map. And so the expansion will join the two existing buildings that they have now, their main building and then the annex building, and will include also other site improvements there on the property. In terms of their timeline, what they are showing in the development agreement uh, is looking at completing the campus by June of 2031, so within a 10-year time frame. Uh, it is anticipated that they would be able to complete their fundraising and start construction start construction earlier than what is shown here, but just to be on the safe side, per the terms of the development agreement, it will give them a 10-year time frame. In terms of the findings that are necessary for approval of the development agreement, we do find that it's consistent with the policies of the general plan and the zoning code, uh, addresses the timing of necessary improvements, and that uh, based on the use and the nature of the project, the proposed development agreement is appropriate. The Planning Commission reviewed this at their meeting last month on November the 17th and uh, recommended approval of the agreement with some minor revisions to the text. With that, Madam Mayor, that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer questions. We also have representative of Desert AIDS Project or DAP Health here this evening, and they are available to answer questions as well. Thank you. Are there any questions uh, for staff? I don't see any. Uh, so with that, uh, I would like to open the public hearing. The applicant will have up to five minutes to provide their testimony and the public is invited to speak on this public hearing for up to two minutes. If there are other speakers, the applicant will be invited to provide a rebuttal for up to two minutes. Uh, does the applicant uh, wish to uh, speak on the project? And Madam Mayor, the uh, applicant will be joining us via Zoom, and if we could let them in. Uh, I would like to open the public Mr. Hearing. Brinkman, if you could turn off the volume.
Mr. Brinkman, if you could turn off the live stream and, and then uh, you are live with the council and you have up to five minutes to provide your comments. And you can begin. First and foremost, I wish to congratulate Madam Mayor Middleton. Your role is history making tonight. Certainly it's an inspiration to trans people everywhere and everyone associated with DAP Health. Thank you. I wish to thank the city council, your city manager and city staff for all your hard work and for your support in getting us to this point. You all have been incredible guides and your support to all of us has meant the world to, to this effort. In alignment with our mayor's priority to provide affordable housing for people experiencing homelessness, we've been working hard towards breaking ground and part of the process is getting Vista Sunrise 2 um, into, uh, shovels into the earth. As uh, you heard, that is well underway, and I'm pleased to share that in February of 2022, uh, construction will commence. At the end of the day, our humanitarian healthcare campus will go from being able to serve our current patient load of 10,000 people to being able to serve 25 thousand people. So whether it be primary care or dentistry, mental health or addiction services, this project I believe will be something that we can all be proud to support. So I thank you all. Are there any questions for Mr. Brinkman? Oh, a whole lot of compliments, uh, David. Uh, if there are no questions, uh, Mr. Mejia, do we have any additional uh, speakers who would like to uh, speak on this uh, project? Or this Madam Mayor, no other speakers for this public hearing. Thank you. Uh, David, I don't think you'll need to do a rebuttal. All right. Uh, is there any discussion or additional uh, questions for council? Uh, council Member Holstage. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, thank you, Mr. Brinkman, for all the work that you do for our community. Um, really impressive work by DAP Health. Um, crucial life-saving work, especially now. I know you've led the way on COVID-19 pandemic with your expertise um, dealing with the AIDS pandemic. So from the bottom of our hearts, thank you. Um, my question is, if you need 10 years, um, and how we can help you and the community build this quicker and, and help you get to your goals. Because it seems like um, this care and this expansion is so desperately needed. And I know that you have a quicker timeline than 10 years, and the 10 years is just to be protective. Um, but I very much would like to see the city support your efforts. Um, I know you're relying on fundraising uh, to do this expansion. Um, and I was just wondering if there are creative ways that the city might um, lend money or um, help fund find other money or apply for state funding or any creative solutions that you might have um, so that we don't have to approve you for 10 years and we can approve you for three years and then we can get this care delivered to our community. I deeply appreciate that. You all know better than I what a special community we live in. This is a $20 million expansion. Uh, prior to COVID, we raised 13 and a half million of it uh, from members of this community. When COVID hit, I went back to that same donor group and said, I've got to ask again. And it seemed like whiplash for them, but they gave so generously so we could respond to COVID in this community. So there is a six and a half million dollar gap to build. Uh, my donor community has given until it hurts, and then they gave again as our COVID response. And so any uh, possibility that the city could have in helping us fill that gap will allow us to complete this construction and bring more people into care quicker than a decade. Thank you. So to city staff, what are the tools available to the city in our toolbox to help bridge that gap for DAP Health? And it's, by the way, not for DAP Health, but the how many thousands of patients do you serve? A year? 10,000 10, a year right now, 25,000 a year when the project's done. Right. So that is such, I mean, 
if you think of it, an investment, the short-term investment for the city, really in, you know, the long-term of the substance abuse and mental health issues and all the health issues, chronic health conditions that our community faces, right? So city staff, what are the um, tools in our toolbox and in terms of um, applying for other types of funding, using um, monies that the cities receive for COVID relief? Um, what are ways that we might be able to at least start a conversation about helping to uh, get DAP to bridge that gap? Yeah, Council Member Holstead, um, I've had a preliminary conversation with Mr. Brinkman about um, just those kind of opportunities. I don't know that staff is prepared this evening to really outline with specificity and detail the, the individual tools, um, but certainly to the extent that uh, we already acknowledge we have a shared mission in serving the community and, and have had a preliminary conversation about ways that we might even further integrate some of uh, the programs and desired outcomes to pair well with some of the city's top priorities. And I think uh, what we'd like to do is um, have some follow-up conversation um, with DAP about what that might look like. And we could certainly bring back a future agenda item. Um, I just don't know that we're prepared this evening to really get into uh, specific tools, um, but certainly um, financial support, or again, as you indicated, possibly um, being a, a public entity um, agency to apply for funding. Uh, there, there could be myriad ways that we might be able to support this effort. Thank you. I would like to see that come back so that we can um, consider how to make sure this project happens um, more quickly for our community. Are there other questions or comments for uh, Mr. Bringman? Seeing none, is there a motion? I'll move approval. Is there a second? Second. I'll second. Roll call. Council Member Kors. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Yes. Council Member Holstedge. Yes. Council Member Woods. Yes. Mayor, Mayor Middleton. Aye. Motion passes five to zero. David, congratulations and thank you. Thank you all very, very much. With that, we will move on to item 2D, a public hearing regarding uh, proposed annual extraordinary rate adjustments for solid waste and recycling and collection services. Uh, before we open the public hearing, I would like to ask our city attorney to explain the requirements of Proposition 218 governing this public hearing and the proposed adoption of the rates and, cha and charges. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, tonight's public hearing was set in compliance with Proposition 218 in order to maximize maximize uh, transparency and in an abundance of caution. That said, the city voluntarily subjected the proposed rates uh, that you'll be hearing tonight to the Prop 218 procedures, and the city doesn't concede necessarily the applicability of Prop 218 to privately provided solid waste service. Uh, the city mailed a notice of this public hearing to all record owners whose property is subject to the imposition of the proposed rates tonight and uh, any customers of records who are not property owners, uh, so tenants, for instance, who are customers. The date and time of this public hearing is not less than 45 days after the city mailed that notice. The purpose of the public hearing tonight is for the city council to hear all oral testimony and consider all written protests concerning the proposed rate increases. It's also held to determine whether there is a majority protest to the proposed rates and whether to proceed with the adoption of the proposed rates. Property owners and tenants are not required to provide oral testimony at tonight's hearing. Uh, if they wish, they may simply submit a written protest directly to the city clerk indicating their opposition to the proposed rate increases. However, if they do wish uh, for their protest to be counted, they must submit a written protest prior to the close of the public hearing tonight. Uh, in that regard, uh, the city clerk's office has uh, staffed a person at the front uh, of City Hall in order to collect any uh, remaining written protests that might be uh, delivered to City Hall tonight before the public hearing. Uh, the public hearing will be closed after the City Council has heard and considered all oral testimony on these items uh, and oral comments made tonight do not qualify as a written protest that will be counted at the end of the process. 
If written protests against the proposed rate increases are presented by a majority of the owners of the identified parcels uh, upon which the charges are to be imposed, or tenants who are directly liable for the payment of those charges, the City Council may not legally impose the rates uh, that are proposed tonight. However, if there is no majority protest, the City Council may impose the rate increases. Pursuant to state statutes governing Proposition 218, in determining whether a majority protest exists, only one written protest per parcel can be counted by the city tonight. With that, I'll turn it back to the mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ballinger. With that, I would like to ask for a staff report. Uh, good evening, council members, and uh, congratulations, Mayor and Mayor Pro Tem. Um, this public hearing item is for solid waste and recycling rate increases. Um, and uh, as a reminder to our uh, residents, uh, these proposed rate increases are for two things. One is an annual rate adjustment, which typically occurs every year. Um, and uh, the second item is an extraordinary rate adjustment, which is the first time that PSDS has asked for a, uh, such a rate adjustment. And this uh, rate adjustment was to address changes in the recycling markets um, that affected uh, and uh, caused them to incur significant costs over the past few years. Um, I would just uh, remind folks that these uh, costs reflects recovery of costs that have already been incurred or are being incurred by PSDS. Um, we have had, uh, been, we talked about this in October of this year. We had a detailed discussion of the rates and how they were uh, uh, calculated. Um, and it was approved to move forward with a public hearing process. Uh, October 25th, the public hearing notice was issued. Um, and actually it was, uh, everything was mailed out on October 22nd. Uh, we did have uh, a few questions that were uh, received as a result of the Proposition 218 notices. And uh, there were about 100 of them uh, that were received and addressed uh, through either PSDS or through uh, city staff. And then uh, we received a minimal number of protests, uh, which our city clerk can uh, describe to you um, uh, at the time of uh, the hearing. Um, the uh, protest, or I'm sorry, the uh, Proposition 218 notice included a list of rates uh, for various services that PSDS provides. Um, and so uh, that, that table was quite lengthy. And so most of the calls that were received were just uh, residents asking for them to, uh, for PSDS or to this, for the city to explain what their specific rate increase would be. Uh, here are a few examples of the typical uh, rate increases that people can expect. Um, and this is for residential economy, the estate service, and then uh, an example of a commercial bin service. Uh, as a reminder, the timing of these rate adjustments, uh, they, they would take effect January 1st if approved. They would uh, be in place from January through June of 2022. And then um, the extraordinary rate adjustment would be eliminated at the end of June. And the annual rate adjustment is uh, basically cut in half and then used to calculate the base rate for the future year's uh, adjustments. So um, this is just a reminder uh, to folks at home, uh, this, these rate adjustments do not address the future SB 1383 services that are gonna be provided. Um, and will uh, uh, those uh, rate adjustments will come to back to council probably in the spring of next year. And that's all I have uh, for that. And I will turn it back to you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Are there questions for staff? Uh, council Member Woods. Yeah, um, you know, I'd asked this question before and I'm going to ask it again. Um, I believe that the residential base rate versus the walk in service was raised higher in a percentage than the walk in service. Is that correct? Uh, yes, the temporary rate adjustments uh, are higher for those services than for the uh, standard residential service. Uh, but then when you remove them, they go back down to being less. But for this, and, and that, that temporary increase is six months? Yes. All right, so for six months, just to make sure that I'm clear, the residential base rate 
will be will increase higher than the walk-in service rate will increase. Yes, it will be slightly higher. Right. Um, and I just want to um, say that I'm opposed to that. I don't think that the um, the disposal service has provided us any evidence that that's the case. Um, I can tell you from my personal experience that people who come in for a weekend consume a lot more than a long-term customer. They have a lot more trash than a long-term customer. And we provided no evidence of that difference. I will approve it, but I just want to state that I don't think the Palm Springs Disposal Service gave us any solid evidence of, of the differential between those two increases. Are there other questions or comments for staff? Uh, seeing none, uh, the public hearing, or excuse me, uh, at this time, I would like to open the public hearing. The public is invited to speak on this public hearing for up to two minutes. Only those written protests submitted prior to the close of the public hearing will be counted. Anyone desiring to submit a written protest may drop it off at City Hall receptionist desk. After oral testimony has been heard, I will close the public hearing. Mr. Mejia. Lyndon Moss, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Um, my comments actually, uh, uh, they just from the front, I'm, I'm understanding here is that this is a temporary measure, uh, basically to cover a deficit uh, due to the pandemic. But what I really don't understand, and maybe you could explain it to me in these two minutes, is that, um, you know, as I see it, and as we all see it, there has been incredible uh, renovations. Um, the real estate market here has been booming. People have been fixing their homes. There's been a tremendous amount of trash that has been generated uh, since 2020, since 2020. So I'm, I'm not really understanding, um, you know, why they are uh, suffering a deficit. So my, my comment is um, I think that we could look more closely at where they are uh getting the revenue from. I'm curious to know if if they have a contract that guarantees them specific annual revenue. And if they don't, then um, why is it that that business is uh, not apt to what every other business is over the pandemic, which is um, my personal business has suffered losses. Everybody's suffered losses. So why are we as customers um, paying for what seems to be a, you know, a, a questionable increase? Uh, Mr. Linden, uh, we, yes. we will have asked staff to respond to your question after your comments. Is there anything else you would like to say? Um, e yes. Um, you know, I'd just like to know if also uh, are they contractually bound to decrease uh, the, their, their, um, their prices again uh, once the deficit is covered? Because I know that that's part of the issue is that supposedly this is going to be a temporary measure. But if they're not bound to that contractually, I have never seen anything go back down in price. Okay. Thank and you. I, I, am, I am finished now, and I'm, I'm, I'm curious to hear your, your answers. We're going to conclude public comment, and then we'll ask staff if they can provide a response. Thank you. Jolie Estrada, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Hi, good evening. Um, so we are longtime Palm Springs residents. Um, and as far as desert waste, um, I just wanted to give my comment that they're a great company. And as far as a minuscule uh, fee or a, any price increase, Compared to a lot of other cities and counties, it's extremely reasonable in the first place. What you have to remember is um, with what's going on all over California right now with inflation and the cost of gas, which is now over $5 per premium gas, um, imagine the cost of gas for those trucks. Um, also, I can tell you... Um, 
we reside elsewhere additionally when my husband's working up in Sacramento and the cost of waste management up here and trying to get anybody to pick anything up, there's a two month wait. So they have been extremely reasonable and also accommodating. Um, you can call them a day or two in, in advance and ask for them to pick something up and they will usually accommodate you. So I think that in the times that we're in, people need to understand that um, such a slight increase is pretty reasonable considering the increase with um, the cost of gas right now especially. And the benefits of others in other locations. Correct. Um, my husband just chimed in there, even though he didn't call in for public comment. Um, but um, if you compare other cities, other counties, um, they're extremely reasonable and accommodating. So it is it is a minuscule increase. And I think the justification would be, as of right now, the cost of everything else going up, Thank clearly you. the Thank price of gas. Thank you for your so, comments. Um, that's all I have to say. And thank you very much. Thank you. Virginia Morin, you're live with the Palm yes. Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. All right. I've lived in the Palm Springs City for about 20 years, and with my vast experiences, I'm fully aware that picking up trash is not some little thing. There are such a, a variety of rules and regulations and hazards, and our disposal company does an amazing job of dealing with those, plus gently reminding our citizens what is a hazard or what is something that's dumpable. And I've been very impressed with them. Whenever I've needed any help, they've helped me. And I would certainly hope that they deserve to get just pay for all of this. And I thank you for listening to my opinion. Thank you. Madam Mayor, that does conclude public comment for this public hearing. Thank you. We did receive uh, some questions from uh, uh, one speaker. Does staff wish to, uh, to provide uh, a response to those questions? Uh, sure, um, council members. Um, I would like to just clarify one point that was raised by one of the callers with regard to the origin of the uh, extraordinary rate adjustment fees uh, and costs. So uh, the extraordinary rate adjustment costs were generated as a result of costs uh, that in were incurred as a result of changes in the recycling market that have occurred since 2016. And so, as was stated in the October 14th staff report, um, PSDS and the city were, were trying to figure out these rate, uh, rate increases and whether or not they were permanent in nature and to figure out how to address them through the franchise. And so, uh, as soon as we uh, arrived at the um, uh, uh, determination that extraordinary rate adjustment would be the most appropriate process, we entered into that uh, discussion with Palm Springs Disposal Services. So it does not really have anything to do with the, um, uh, the pandemic and the changes that may have occurred during the pandemic. These uh, changes were a result of broader changes to the recycling market that have occurred for the past several years. So uh, I did wanna mention that. I believe there was a question about whether or not there's a, the, there's a requirement for a specific revenue under the contract and there is not. Um, uh, and um, let's see, contractually bound to, oh, uh, question of whether or not we, uh, PSDS is required to decrease their fees. Um, so the nature of the extraordinary rate adjustment fees are, are temporary in nature and um, they will be expired in uh, June of next year. So um, that is part of the rates that we are basically agreeing to uh, with Palm Springs Disposal through this process. Uh, and again, those rates would be, would be uh, 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 basically decreased at the end of that period. Um, 
And uh, the rates themselves are, are primarily based on uh, tipping fees and hauling fees that are charged by other entities uh, where Palm Springs Disposal takes its recycling and um, waste material. And so as those prices fluctuate, their prices reflect those fluctuations. So if those were to go down or we were to identify a less expensive alternative for some of those disposal um, uh, the disposed of or recycled items, then uh, the rates would uh, effectively decrease. So, so yes. Great. Uh, Mr. Tallarico, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, with that, uh, there being no other speakers, the public hearing is now closed. Uh, Mr. Mejia, please tabulate the results for all valid written protests submitted prior to the close of the public hearing. Madam Mayor, prior to the close of the public hearing, we received a total of nine formal written protest letters and 13 emails of objection regarding the, the rates for solid waste service charges. Therefore, a majority protest was not reached and the City Council may proceed with the adoption of the proposed resolution to increase the City's solid waste service charges. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any uh, further discussion or additional questions from Council? Council Member Holstitch. Thank you. You forgot I used to ask a lot of questions when I wasn't mayor. Um, I'm sorry, so Patrick, thank you for helping me out with this. So I just have a few questions based on the comments that we heard. So, um, and other concerns. So is there a process for low income customers um, who, or those who this would create an undue hardship for? Could you explain to us um, that process for assistance, like bill assistance? Mm -hmm. uh, sure. Uh, so I actually was having this conversation with Palm Springs Disposal Services just before uh, this hearing. And um, there is a uh, discounted rate for seniors. Um, so they do offer that discounted rate. Um, however, there is not anything set up currently for uh, like low income residents um, that may be challenged by this increase. I did speak to them and uh, they are willing to work with us to, to establish that kind of a program. And we think that we may be able to do it uh, through potential, some potential offsets in the amount of franchise fee that we collect as the city. So, so I believe there, there could be a way to do that um, that is fairly easy. So. So um, with your permission, we, we can have some further conversations with them about that and uh, uh, come up with some sort of a program. Thank you. I would love to see that. I know that so many governmental entities and cities have been doing rate pay payer assistance programs, especially during the pandemic when people can't pay basic utilities and the cost of gas and inflation is so high. So it's really, really hard to increase rates right now, even if they're short term. Mm -hmm. Um, and I would very much, I mean, just good public policy, I think, would be to have a low income program like other utilities do. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, and, and, and we can also look at uh, incorporating that into the next round of uh, rate adjustments to next year. Right. And that's, mm -hmm. I think, the question that you raise is what's yeah. the role of the city and is it worth increasing rates of broadly or can the city subsidize portions of that for certain users who might not be able to afford it, those types of things. Right. So what's the total amount, amount of the rate increase per customer and on average? Sure. So uh, for people with uh, the standard residential economy service, uh, it's about $7. Um, uh, let's see, that's about eight, almost $8 uh, per month for the six months. Okay, thank yep. you. And then is, are we working with Palm Springs Disposal to confirm where the recycling is going on the back end? I saw a number of reports, like the city of Sacramento um, had been contracting with their hauler or their disposal service, but then um, often the recycling wasn't actually making it to be recycled, right, um, right on the back end. So do we have any, process to confirm that? So we work fairly closely uh, with PSDS and uh, Burtech, uh, who processes the recyclable materials that we generate. 
to keep up to speed on where they're taking the material and what challenges they're experiencing and what markets they're tapping into. Um, to date, um, we have been pretty impressed with their ability to shift markets and, and try to find markets for materials. Um, so for the most part, I believe that the materials that we are sending them, uh, as long as they are not contaminated, are, are going to the appropriate places. Um, this is all going to change, I will say, when uh, the new California laws take effect um, in, in the next uh, couple of years. Um, in the truth and labeling laws and uh, the requirement that um, material that sh is shipped overseas is not counted as recyclable. So all that, uh, again, is going to have to be updated and rethought um, kind of statewide. Do we get information from Palm Springs Disposal about how much is contaminated and being actually recycled? Um, I don't believe that we collect that data from uh, Burtek, do we? Yeah. Um, Okay, so uh, Palm Springs Disposal Services is here, and they said that we can uh, we can get that uh, some of that information from Burtek. The one of the challenges that we have uh, with that number is that our material goes to a um, transfer station where it is combined with material from all of the other Valley cities. So it's sometimes uh, hard to backtrack um, our. Uh, the, our material from from the other material that's collected. So, so we would have to look at how that would be how that data is collected and how it would be attributed to us. Thank you. I'd love if Palm Springs Disposal can give me a walkthrough of our whole system, yeah. um, so we can learn because I think we're so removed from this, and it's such yeah. an important issue. I just have my last question about um, where does this include uh, organic waste, mm -hmm. and where is that going? So um, the or so on a residential side, the organic waste is currently an additional service that some customers may have. Um, so they may have a green bin or they may not have a green bin. Um, the uh, organic waste that is collected from residences is yard waste, and that material is taken to the Edom Hill facility. Uh, which is up in Cathedral City, and uh, that they have a basically a yard waste processing facility there where they make mulch and, and other items that is typically for agricultural use. Thank you. Are there other questions or comments? Seeing none, uh, is there a motion? I'll move the item. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Kors? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Gardner? Yes. Councilmember Holstitch? Yes. Councilmember Woods? Reluctantly, yes. Mayor Middleton? Aye. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, we will not be moving on to item 2E, which has been uh, deferred, and that takes us uh, to uh, legislative, which is uh, a proposed ordinance amending the Palm Springs, uh, excuse me, item is 3A, consideration of an ordinance amending the Palm Springs Municipal Co Code to update the prima facie speed limits of various city streets. Uh, I'd like to ask for a staff report. Um, good evening, Madam Mayor and City Council members. My name is Don Ueno. I'm your principal civil engineer for the city. And um, the item before you tonight is the, um, an ordinance to amend our speed limits for the city of Palm Springs. Um, basically, um, the current speed limits that are on the books uh, were last updated in 2013. Um, we have recently done a citywide speed survey, um, and then um, we had our consultant traffic engineers uh, prepare an engineering and traffic 
um, survey, which is the legal document that um, backs up the speed limits. Um, bef the reason the item is before you tonight is that um, this year, the state of California passed Assembly Bill 43, which um, allows the city, the local government, um, to consider other things in addition to setting the speed limit at the 85th percentile. And just as a point of uh, kind of privilege, I just wanted to um, highlight and honor our own mayor, um, our own <laughs> Mayor Middleton, who um, since 2019 served on the Zero Fatality Task Force that eventually their recommendations became Assembly Bill 43, which has now been codified and will take effect on January 1st, 2022. So uh, we're very excited. I'm very proud to say that our mayor was a part of that. And um, the reason why we're bringing that here tonight was that by using Assembly Bill 43, we will be able to keep the speed limit the same on 18 street segments in our city, which is mostly on the Indian Canyon Corridor, Takwitz Canyon Way, um, and some other miscellaneous streets in the city. But we would like to use that extra flexibility that AB 43 provides us starting January 1st. Um, and um, using that to keep the speed limits um, as is posted today. Um, just some highlights on that engineering and traffic study that was done um, earlier this year. Um, we are going to be able to reduce the speed limits on 36 street segments of the 215 that were evaluated and the rest of the balance of the streets will remain the same. So there's no increases, a reduction in 36 segments, and um, the rest of them will stay the same. Um, we do have our traffic consultants um, available on Zoom um, if you have further detailed questions, um, but that concludes my report tonight. Okay, thank you. I uh, really appreciate that. Are there uh, any questions for uh, our civil engineer? Uh, Council Member Holstich. I just wanted to make a motion to move staff recommendation. Is there a second? I'll second. All right. Uh, Council Member Woods, did you have discussion or were you? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, to point out to the community at large um, that you know we, we get a lot of complaints about speeding. And uh, setting the speed limit to a lower speed alone will not solve the speeding problem. Uh, we really need to reinvest in our streets and the geometrics of our streets. Um, our staff has the skills to do that. We just had a city council have not made that a priority to do in our city. So I think one of the things we need to do is um, and. Uh, in, in our strategic plan for next year is to really look at funding more for street geometric changes to try and slow the streets to beautify our streets and make them safer and better for multimodal use. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Right. Thank you, Council Member Woods. Uh, uh, let me jump in and I will keep it short, uh, but <laughs> uh, this is uh, an issue near and dear to my heart. And uh, uh, for the folks uh, on Farrell, for the folks on Toledo, for the, for any number of uh, streets across the city, uh, speed limits are going to finally be coming down. Uh, and as uh, the staff report indicated, uh, without AB 43, there are 18 streets that we would have had to increase uh, speed limits that we're now uh, able not to. Uh, I would like to ask staff to go back, uh, and I don't want to hold up the uh, moving forward, but we do have a number of streets, and I'll take Farrell as an example, where according to this uh, survey that we have now, uh, the speed limit, for instance, from uh, Ramon, on Farrell Drive from Ramon to Mesquite 
will be uh, 45 miles an hour. But then from moving north from Ramon up to Alejo, it will be 40 miles an hour. Uh, as we move south from Mesquite to East Palm Canyon Drive, it will go back to 40. Uh, that's going to be very confusing for individuals to have a speed limit that changes uh, multiple times on what's going to appear to be a common street. So uh, if there is an opportunity to take and uh, within the law, treat all of these streets uh, a individual street as a large segment and reduce the speed limit to an appropriate amount on that uh, segment, I think we should uh, uh, do our best to do so. Uh, and I, does staff want to comment on that at this point or would you like to just uh, have time to study the issue further? Yeah, Madam Mayor, um, we've actually um, had the same concerns and we did have a large, long discussion with our consultants about it. And in reviewing all of the data, um, there was just no way to get it back down to 40. Um, there, we we've even did some additional speed studies out there to see if there was any way possible to make it more consistent. Um, but I do remember long conversations with that specific roadway and staff has exhausted all um, possible um, tools in our toolbox to make that change. Well, AB 43 gave us some additional flexibility. It did not give us uh, unilateral uh, flexibility, and uh, uh, but it is progress. So uh, we have a motion and we have a second. Are there any other uh, comments? And then let me make one. Uh, I think we're the first city in the state of California to act on this. And I am so proud of our staff uh, for moving so quickly on uh, this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Mejia, can we get a roll call? Council Member Holstage. Yes. Council Member Coors. Yes. Councilmember Woods. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Yes. Mayor Middleton. Aye. Motion passes five to zero. All right. Uh, that takes us to the uh, end of uh, uh, our uh, items other than uh, city council and city manager requests and upcoming agenda development. Uh, Mayor and Council, um, we don't have an updated future agenda document in part because we have a, a little extended break over the winter holiday before we um, resume meetings in January. Also, uh, that document and some of our efforts to plan future work will change between now and then as we work to incorporate the uh, strategic priorities uh, that Council has set forth for us and present those to Council. So um, we do have plenty of things still in the pipeline, um, but again, we'll probably change the way we do some of that work planning moving forward. So um, nothing for review this evening. Council members. I don't see or hear any. Uh, well, we're, we're closing. Oh, Council Member Garner, thank you. Sorry, just one one final thing since we're actually going to be gone for um, a whole month. Um, I would just ask that when we come back to discuss the COVID restrictions um, in January, that we talk to some of those small businesses that are off the strip to see if they have any input or um, further input than, than what we've heard from them. Um, I think that would be helpful since we mostly hear from downtown merchants. Um, but then just... Happy holidays, everyone. Uh, Council Member Coors. Yeah, just one thing uh, for the community, but um, I'm happy uh, to work with staff on this, but we should start really pushing out the point in time count um, of homeless residents is January 26 next year. And um, we've been really great. Our residents have really helped um, us have more volunteers than any city our size. Um, which sometimes gets us a higher count because you have more people, you get a higher count. 
but that's how we've been able to get funding uh, to provide services. So uh, the more we can get it out there and really promote this through 1PS and the nonprofits and to our community, uh, the better. So just a reminder, since we won't be meeting, I think till the second meeting in January, and there's a short in person or sometimes I think online training people need to do before the count. So, and happy holidays, everyone. Any other comments? Well, we are closing at a reasonable hour and uh, I know this has gotten some attention lately. Uh, it had already gotten attention from all of us. Uh, we are uh, working with staff to try to find ways to, uh, to make our meetings as efficient and as effective as they can uh, and get ourselves out at, uh, at a reasonable hour. So uh, the very best of the holidays to absolutely everyone. The next regular city council meeting will be held on January 13, 2022, beginning at 5.30 p.m. Uh, safe and happy holidays, everyone.